Hey there, quick heads up. You're currently watching part two of a two part series where I rank every single shrine in the Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom from worst to best. There are 152 shrines in this game, so in part one we went over the 76 worst ones, and this time we'll be going over the 76 best ones. If you haven't seen part one yet, you can click the link in the description or the little pop up in the top right to go check it out. I recommend you watch that first if you want to be up to speed here. If you just came from the previous part and want to get right into the rest of the ranking, feel free to skip to the timestamp shown on screen. But if you want a quick recap of how things work here, stick around for a little bit longer. First and most importantly, the shrines are judged on their design, not so much my personal experience with them. All of the shrine footage you'll see comes from my second playthrough of them all, which I streamed and solely did for this ranking, meaning it's also not my first time experiencing any of them. Roru's Blessing Shrines, which don't have puzzles in them, are judged on what you have to do to get into the shrine, as that's the whole point of them. In some very rare cases, a couple normal shrines are also judged on what you have to do to get into them, but that's not common at all, and when they do show up, I'll obviously point it out. Every normal shrine has at least one bonus chest in them, for which you usually have to do some kind of mini puzzle to get to them, and those puzzles will also be taken into account, though they aren't as important to a shrine's quality as the main puzzles, and what's actually in the chest doesn't matter one bit. Outside materials are essentially banned in the shrines for this ranking, otherwise you'd be able to just rocket shield or bomb jump over all the puzzles, and it's not really fair to judge a shrine when doing that. Basically, every shrine is ranked on the developer intended way of clearing them, but this rule doesn't apply to weapons, bows, arrows, shields, and armor. You always need those. This ranking is inspired by Odyssey Central's video, where he ranks every moon in Super Mario Odyssey, which will be linked in the description if you're interested. And lastly, all the icons you'll be seeing in the bottom left corner are made by my good friend Pinky Bowtie, who will also be linked down below. And that's pretty much all I needed to say before we start. Let's just get right back into the ranking, and don't forget to subscribe if you enjoy this type of content. I said last time that I think a lot of the shrines in this game are lacking, and currently we're still only at the shrines I consider to be just fine, which is also how I would describe... Number 76, Katanisi Shrine, a wall timed bounce. This is another one of those shrines that was shouted out quite a bit online, because the use of the physics engine in it is really impressive according to other game developers. Basically, a giant metal ball falls on top of a huge spring-loaded platform, and you're supposed to realize that when it initially lands, it hits the platform really hard, which makes it dip down a lot pretty quickly. So you gotta recall it at the right time to use that quick dip in reverse to instead launch the ball upwards, making it hit a target on a ceiling. This can actually be somewhat difficult because it's such a foreign fantasy idea, and it's a great example of a shrine where even if you know what to do, it can still take you a while. Once you finally get it though, it's really satisfying, but sadly this is again the only puzzle in the shrine. After this, you're done. Luckily, the bonus chest is really good. It's located on top of the block with the target you gotta hit on the bottom, and you're likely to spot it while trying to go for the target with the ball. Pretty clever. You obviously gotta use the platform to launch Link himself up there. Easier said than done, especially with the ball also coming at you, which you really can't do much about since you obviously need it to hit the platform to make it dip down. Really cool shrine, I just again wish there was more to it. Number 75, Kamatuki Shrine, a precise strike. Remember those motion control apparatus shrines from Breath of the Wild that everyone just absolutely loved? Well, this one kinda reminded me of those, but it's done a bit better. You have to hit a ball with a hammer you can swing with Ultra Hand, aka motion controls, if you want, and try to hit it into a goal. This is a lot of fun to do, and it honestly is pretty challenging. I ended up cheesing it with Recall, which normally would go kinda against my rules for this ranking, but I thought the idea of using Recall for it like that was just too smart to not do, and I felt pretty proud of coming up with it. Sadly, getting the orb in the goal immediately opens the door to the exit, so this is another shrine where you only need to finish one puzzle, but the bonus chest has a second challenge with it, so it's fine in my book. These are the absolute best kinds of bonus chests, ones where it just lets you do the main puzzle again but in a different way. They're optional to do, but they're just there for players that want that extra challenge. Ironically though, I think this one for the bonus chest is way easier than the required puzzle, but maybe that's just me. Also, it's a bit random and unnecessary in my eyes that you have to attach the blocks to the sticks to form the hammers yourself. I don't really see why you'd have to do that, but I suppose it's to make slightly different shaped hammers if you think that would help. It's not really needed though, and it doesn't matter a lot, so it's like, whatever, I guess. Number 74, Turakamic Shrine, Hidden Metal. So this shrine is based around using metal to conduct electricity. First with some balls you have to attach, which makes a cock turn, letting you go upwards. And then you have to do it again, but the balls on the chains are too far apart to simply stick one against the other. So you gotta find a way to get them both close at the same time. I like it you can do different stuff. Some players might use recall somehow, and others, like me, might just swing on one of the balls and ultra hand the other to stick them together when they're close. This makes four pillars in the wall alternate between extending and retracting, which is so random that it really confuses me. 
honestly don't see the point in having this when they could have just as well only had the last pillar. It wouldn't have changed much, if anything. The way it is now, it doesn't add any challenge. There's nothing for you to figure out. It's just how they decided to do it. I don't know, I'm probably overreacting. It's not a big deal anyways. After this is a cock that's turning because of a stick that's extending the powered cock into the unpowered one. You'll never guess what you'll have to deal with the big cock. That's right, recall it and stand on it to reach the bonus chest. Crazy concept. If you don't remember from the previous video, I mentioned that pretty much every shrine with a cock like this in it has you recall it at some point. Anyways, I like that you have to essentially unsolve that puzzle which was already solved when you entered, because you need the metal stick from it to finish the last puzzle, since the chain with the metal ball is too short. That's the end of the shrine, and I think it's pretty good, but I don't understand the name Hidden Metal though. There really isn't any metal that is hidden here. Does it refer to the stick you have to remove? I guess so, but again, it's not very hidden. You can see that you can detach it thanks to the green zona glue already being there. Number 73, Turakawak Shrine, Stacking a Path. This shrine is pretty good, but it relies on an aha moment that I feel is too easy to spoil for yourself. Basically, the shrine wants you to stack these two climbable blocks so you can reach this ladder, getting you to the floor above. Then it wants you to notice this grating from which you can see the previous floor, so that you can stack all three blocks here above it, then fall down, and then finally ascend through the whole thing to get to the finish, instead of climbing on the climbable blocks, since that wouldn't work because one of the three blocks is unclimbable, so you'd never make it to the top. This is really clever, but because the shrine starts with you climbing upwards on one of the climbable blocks, you're far too likely to also look upwards and spot the grating you're supposed to notice at the end too early. This happened to me, and I thought that's how you had to get up to the next floor. I didn't even see the ladder until way after when I just stacked the two climbable blocks to try and pull them from above through that hole. The bonus chest is also weird because you have to do essentially the same thing as the main puzzle to get inside the cage that has the chest. If anything, I feel like this would just increase the chance of having players get spoiled on the aha moment at the end. It's still a good shrine, just one where I feel like it's too easy to accidentally miss the point of it. Number 72, Tajikat Shrine, Building with Logs. Because of its placement in the overworld, this was most players' first shrine after the ones in the tutorial, and as such, it's pretty memorable. Not to mention, it's a good shrine as well. First, you literally just put a lock vertically to introduce the concept, which you did also have to do in the tutorial, but again, first shrine, so reintroducing the idea here is fair. After that, it already gets interesting, because you have to cross this, and you're only given two locks to do so. Three, if you remember, you can reuse the one from the previous puzzle. There is such an obvious lack of an intended solution here that no matter what you do, the player is going to feel like a genius. The locks will roll off if you just use them by themselves, so I made this, and I can confirm, I felt like a genius. After that, you literally just make a pull to cross some water, and then you make a longer pull to cross a slightly bigger gap, which feels a little too easy after what you just did, but I do like it because they give you way more locks than you'd need, and I feel like most players would want to dick around a bit and test the limits of Ultra Hand after just finishing the tutorial, and the devs totally understand that, so they give you way more than you need. Even after this, there's another huge stack of locks if you want to test the limits even further. Yeah, this shrine has a lot of parts, and for the end you have to build something with the locks and some fans to cross water, which again feels a little too simple, especially since you just had to do that a few times during the tutorial. But I guess it's different this time because you're more incentivized to try your own thing here, which would result in some players just making a gigantic stick like this to cross the lake, which is definitely fun. Alright, now we're at the shrines I initially gave a 7 out of 10. These were by far the hardest to order from worst to best because, well, let's just say I gave a lot of shrines a 7 out of 10. It's just the perfect score to give good shrines that aren't outstanding, you know what I mean? Anyways, number 71, Ikatak Shrine, Roro's Blessing. This is a crystal shrine where the crystal is in a nearby cave, which you enter via a hole in the ceiling. There are a couple enemies in there for you to defeat, but they aren't really the focus of this shrine. The crystal is obviously in here, as well as some rockets, and since the only way in this cave was through the hole in the ceiling, it's pretty obvious what you gotta do. Awesome. It's really not the hardest shrine at all, and it's not that deep either, but it's just plain fun to launch it through the hole like that. Great example of a stupid shrine that solely exists to be fun, which is, you know, the entire point of video games. Number 70, 10 best shrine, gravity and velocity. This one is fun and creative, but it's weakened a bit by being somewhat frustrating. There's a switch that when you hit it, it switches the whole place between normal and low gravity, which is a super unique mechanic right off the bat. There's a big ball that's being tossed between two launchers, and you gotta change gravity when it's on the right launcher so that it'll fly up and hit the target on the left, which opens up a gate on the right side for you to go through, and here comes the frustrating part. When you come here, there's another gravity switch and another launcher facing another target in a cage. 
So it's pretty obvious you're supposed to get the ball used in the previous puzzle in here. So you go back down and make sure the gravity is low when the boulder is on the left side this time. Problem is that for some reason the ball seems to disappear if it gets launched into that second room if you're not in it. And if that happens, it can take a pretty long time for the ball to reappear and we launch into that room again because of the low gravity. So if you want a shot at the last puzzle, it can have a bit of a downtime. I was super confused as to what was happening that caused the ball to not be in the second room that it became kind of annoying. Eventually, I did manage to get it into this room while I was in it, and here you gotta let the ball get launched while it's in low gravity, and then switch to normal gravity at the right time so it falls in the hole. This isn't very hard, but again, if you fill this or just see what happens the first time, it can again take a while for you to get another shot at it. This is the final puzzle here, and it's a good shrine like I said, just kinda left a bad taste in my mouth. Also, the bonus chest is exceptionally bad. You literally just have to get launched from the right launcher at the start which you have to do with the left one anyways to continue on in the shrine, so nothing unique at all. Number 69, Gamimi Shrine Turbine Power. This one has a bunch of torches that you have to light at the same time, otherwise they get doused by a sprinkler above them, so how do you light them all? Well, if you look up, you'll see that there's a fire source most likely coming from a flame emitter, so you have to put this fan on the turbine in the center and power it by conducting a metal plate from an energy source. This spins the fan and allows you to make it up to the fire, where there are three flame emitters. You obviously have to use a flame emitter on the spinning turbine and using just one would probably work just fine, but I love that they gave you three because more flame emitters would make them spin more satisfying. And I think the devs know that, why else would they give you three? This ends the shrine and yeah, it's not super complex or anything, but I think it's pretty memorable because the spinning flames is just super satisfying. And it's cool that you have to use the same turbine in two different ways. The bonus chest is one of those bad just look around and notice it chests, but I suppose you also had to notice the flame emitters up top, which are across from the chest, so I feel like it's pretty likely for players to also see the chest when looking up for the fire. Doesn't really make it a good challenge though. Number 68, Natak Shrine, Varu's Blessing. Remember that crystal blessing from 3 entries ago where you have to launch it through a hole in the ceiling? Well this one is kind of the same idea, but instead of a hole in the ceiling, it's through a hole in a big orb you're inside of that you can spin with Ultra Hand. And instead of using rockets, you use this pre-built liftoff device with a spring. I like this one for a similar reason, so I don't have much to say. It's just a bit more fun because you have to align the big orb you're in. But what I can add on here is that I wish the spring device wasn't already in the exact spot it needs to be. It would have been way more interesting if you had to line up the shot with the green crystal line going through the pedestal. The game surprisingly never really has a puzzle where you have to use the line like that, and this would have been the perfect opportunity for it, especially since missing would just make the crystal respawn next to you because this is on a sky island, so retrying would be quick and painless. Number 67, Jiru Tagamak Shrine, a flying device. At the start you're presented with a wing liftoff ramp which will occasionally spawn a wing on top of it, showing you that it comes nowhere near making it to the exit. So you gotta somehow make a stronger flying device out of it to make it over the huge gap. First you go to the left to give your wing some sick wheels, and then you use that to go to the right where you can give your wing a fan, the important part. After all that, you use your newly formed plane to shoot off towards the exit, and you can actually make it this time. This is pretty fun and somewhat creative, but I do have one problem with it, the wing liftoff ramp at the start. It's there to show you that with just a wing you're not gonna make it all the way to the end, but the ironic part is that you can make it from this ramp, you just have to do some creative thinking at the end. The exit of the shrine is on a little floating platform here, meaning you can easily just make it under there with a normal wing and just ascend when you're under it. You might remember the shrine Wings on the Wind, which I ranked at number 105, which I criticized for essentially the same problem, but the reason I think this shrine is much better despite having the exact same issue is because I think what comes before it is more interesting. I like making the ultimate Zonai wing here a lot more than having to remember these seemingly random fans on the floor from their previous shrine. And also the gap you have to cross here is much larger, so it's probably not as obvious that you can skip the entire puzzle here. So ironically, it is still super easy. So, you know, still kind of bad. Again, this could have easily been avoided if they just didn't have the exit on a floating platform, but instead on a massive pillar connecting to the void, so that you can't get under it and use ascent. It's not a huge deal, because the majority of players probably won't think to do this their first time in here, but I think it's important to make shrines as uncheesable as possible with what you can find within the shrine itself, which this one fills pretty badly at. But another reason this one scored higher than the other one is because the bonus chest is really, really clever. It's up on a platform above a small gap, and using a fan doesn't get you up there, so you have to put the wing over this gap so you can stand under the platform and use ascent. 
That's a really creative use of a wing, though it also probably increases the chance of players realizing they can just ascend under the final platform. Whoops. Number 66, Ijo'o Shrine more than defense. With a name like that, you'd probably assume this shrine is based on using shields, and you're right. More specifically, it's based on putting stuff on your shields with fuse and using them like that. For example, at the start you fight an enemy with a flame emitter on its shield, and there's some ice you have to melt with it. That's cool and all, but sadly there's just a normal flame emitter sitting on the side which you can use instead. I get that they did this in case the player somehow breaks the flame emitter shield from the enemy before they can melt the ice with it, which is possible since using the flamethrower drains its durability. But I think a smarter way to prevent this would have been to just make the enemy respawn with the shield if that happened. After this, the shrine is pretty basic, but still good. You use a shield with a big stone plate on it to block some fire, which is smart because the enemy holding it is likely to do that if you decide to use your previously obtained flame emitter against it, at least for a bit before they just drop their guard and let themselves get burned. And after that, you just use a rocket on a shield to launch yourself up to the exit. Not that spectacular, but not bad either. The bonus chest is pretty bad though. It's just sitting in more ice right after you just melted the other ice obstacle. That is so lazy and boring. Number 65, Sepapa Shrine, Backtrack. This one is focused on recall and it's located pretty close to the starting area, so it makes sense for the first puzzle to be mind-numbingly easy, like oh gee I wonder what I have to do here in this shrine called Backtrack. After this you come across a door with two unlit flames that you obviously have to light with the nearby torch. You see some floating water with a plank floating down it next to some fire, so you take the torch, ride the plank for a bit, recall it, and then light the torch afterwards, slowly making your way to the door to light those candles. The waiting aspect here is pretty boring obviously, but the actual puzzle is good I think. Also, if you're a dumbass like me, you cancel the recall for no reason, which makes Link put away the torch, and thus also the fire. I uh, I didn't think of that. Anyways, after this comes a really cool puzzle. You're faced with two closed gates, two orb goals, and only one orb. If you put the orb in the goal closest to where it spawns, which most players will probably do instinctively, it opens up the door that is still behind the closed one. So naturally you think, oh that must mean the other goal opens the first door. So you put it in there and sure enough that is the case. But you have to take the orb out of the first goal which recloses the second door. What do you do to fix this? Well at this point you're probably just gonna wander through the first door. And at that point you have to remember that you initially put the orb in the hole it now has to be in. So you recall it and watch it slowly make its way to where you first put the orb. I think this is so clever because instincts make you essentially solve half this puzzle on your own without even knowing it, which you then later have to remember you did. It's like the shrine was built with the human brain in mind and I think that's super cool. I can't think of any other puzzles in the game doing something like that from the top of my head. Number 64, Iko Chu Shrine Rise and Fall. I don't really have a lot to say about this one, it's just another simple recall based shrine, though the solutions are kinda clever. First you launch a platform with a button that slides back to you, so you stand on it and recall. Then you recall a climbable block that gets pushed by a small flowing river, and then the final puzzle is the most interesting one. There's a button that when pressed down by a block makes a launcher go up, so you gotta hold it above the button, recall it so you can get onto the launcher, and then let it drop back down onto it so the launcher activates with you on it. It's simple, but pretty well thought out. The bonus chest is pretty cool too, since there's a small sense of urgency with the flowing water, which will always make the cube move. Not that much urgency, but still, you know, the illusion is there. Number 63, Chichim Shrine Rose Blessing. This is pretty much just a dark maze, and I usually don't really like mazes, but this one is very well done in my opinion. It starts with you going down a sand pit, and then you're in an underground abandoned prison it seems like. It's very atmospheric. It also uses levers a lot to open up some prison cells, which the maze introduces well. Eventually you see a chest behind some bars that you'd naturally want to get to, so you drop down to a lower level and explore there for a bit to find your way to the chest. At some point the floor falls from under you, which seems like a trap, but it's actually the way you have to go, which threw me off for a bit the first time I passed it. Once you get to the chest you'll notice some slabs you can remove to reveal another lever, which moves a pillar out of the way so you can finally get to the shrine. Sorry if that explanation seemed too much like a walkthrough, it's hard to find stuff to point out in the shrines that are just pretty good, you know what I mean? If there is something I can say about this one, it's that I don't really like how the shrine just kinda appears out of nowhere at the end. Nothing lets you know that this is all for a shrine until you're basically at the end, which kinda makes it feel a little tacked on. It's not a big deal though, I'm just kinda spitting my thoughts into this segment, and I guess if you're using this shrine sensor you'd probably know this was for a shrine at the start. But again, I already went over my negative thoughts on the shrine sensor in this game in the previous video, so take it as you will. Personally, I'm not a fan. 
Number 62, Rutafu Shrine, Varu's Blessing. This one's cool because it's a crystal shrine where the crystal is in a deep body of freezing water in a cold cave, too far away to be able to reach with Ultra Hand. And there's nothing in the immediate vicinity that could float on the water for you to stand on to get closer to the crystal. So how do you get it? Well, if you remember that this is in a cold cave, you might realize that there are icicles on the ceiling, which you can break off to turn into a long stick to poke into the water and attach your crystal onto, essentially letting you fish it out. There's a puzzle similar to this one in the Wind Temple, and I just like this idea so much because icicles are normally just random background elements that you wouldn't pay much attention to. Really clever use of the world's environment. Number 61, Gataki Shrine, Ride the Winds. This is a pretty basic obstacle course, but with the twist that you fly through it. You probably intended to do it all with the paraglider, but it's a lot more fun if you just mostly use the diving mechanic, especially if you have part of the diving suit. The arrow shooting constructs at the end don't really pose much of a threat at all, but it just makes the end feel a bit more intense. Not to mention that the jump scare of them being there after diving through the ice is pretty cool as well. Again, sorry if I don't have a lot to say about some of these. This whole 7 out of 10 shrines segment is probably going to have a lot of ones we'll go through pretty quickly. Number 60, Sanmik Shrine, Scoop It Out. This one feels a little untested, but it's still fun. There's this big wheel with a huge ball pit under it, you can power the wheel to make a turn, and you're supposed to get one of the balls up to the top floor to put it in this goal here. But nothing is stopping you from just ultra handing an orb out of the pit yourself. So the challenge really comes from getting a ball up to the goal, which isn't what the name would imply. I still tried to scoop out a ball, and I definitely succeeded, but the balls wouldn't go up to where they had to go because of how I made the part that actually scoops them out. So I eventually made a V-shaped cup of sorts, attached it to the other side of the wheel, and just placed a ball into it to let it bring it up there. It might be possible to scoop out a ball and get it up to the top all in one go, but that seems almost impossible to me with the layout and the tools you're provided. Something that made me feel really smart though is that I put the metal plank that powers the wheel where it had to be and then off it again so that I could climb up and recall it from a distance back on there so that I could get a better shot of the end. That felt cool. The bonus chest is super weak though in my opinion. It's hidden in the ball pit so you're probably supposed to also scoop it out with the wheel but one, that actually does seem impossible without noticing it and grabbing it yourself first and two, where's the fun in that? Oh, oops, I solved the puzzle without knowing. Not a great chest, if you ask me. Number 59, Oogim Shrine, Vrao's Blessing. This is probably one of the best examples of fun in simplicity. There's an empty shrine pedestal, and if you activate the line to the crystal, it goes through a waterfall that's directly across from it. So after making your way behind the waterfall, because it's a video game waterfall, so obviously something would be behind it, you find a crystal along with a wing liftoff ramp and a bunch of zone devices, including a wing if you blast away this hard rock wall. So you just make a simple plane with the wing, and I love that they also provide you with a rocket, despite not really needing it, because it makes the blast off straight through the waterfall a lot more impactful and fun. And after that, all you do is fly straight to the shrine pedestal and you're done. If you break it down, this is really just go to a crystal, make flying machine, fly straight to the shrine. Which doesn't sound fun, but it adds a lot of oomph with the whole blasting through a waterfall thing and flying across the big gap. It's simple, but still so much fun. Number 58, Kitawak Shrine Upward and Forward. This is another shrine with a pretty basic mechanic that I can't really comment too much on. The main gimmick is the spring-loaded platforms that you will have to weigh down in some way. The concept is introduced well at the start and the solution is super simple. You just put another plank on it to make it heavier so you can cross it. But what I really like is that you'll use this same plank for the rest of the shrine. First in the bonus chest where you attach it to this turning cock. Kinda weird because this is the only time the shrine uses a cock but whatever. Then you attach it to this plank which you first have to weigh down with another one nearby. And here I like that you have to make it so you can still cross the planks despite it being stopped by the ground you're standing on. After that comes the last puzzle which has a platform that's not spring loaded but there's a launcher under it that'll make you shoot towards the wall. But you have to make it longer with your plank buddy from the start to give Link more travel distance, thus actually launching him forwards. Again I don't have much to say, it's just a good shrine. Number 57, Mogawak Shrine, The Power of Water. For a shrine with that name, it doesn't really focus on water, but more so this little battery that you can move around. At the start of the shrine, you have to make a water wheel, which will power this little charging station for you to put this external battery onto, so you can use it for other parts in the shrine. I guess in that sense, the name still kind of works because you charge this battery through a water-powered charging station. And to be fair, the bonus chest also uses water, because you have to use the battery to conduct its electricity through a metal ball on a chain, which you then have to move nearby another metal ball on a chain to power the door on the other side, while at the same time leaving enough room for you to safely swim through the electrified water. 
This is a fantastic bonus chest, but I can't really think of any other shrine where the name is influenced from the bonus chest instead of the main gimmick, which in this case is the battery. The second and last main puzzle has to put the battery on this little station to power this fan elevator up to the exit. If you look at just the two required puzzles, this is an insanely short shrine, but it's so creative and cool that I'm fine with it. One thing that does confuse me is that no other shrine in the game uses this little external battery that you can charge up and then move around. So I find it odd that it doesn't start on the charging station. I can totally see players not knowing what to do here, because they don't realize this random thing on the floor is a battery they can charge up and transfer power with. So I think it would have made more sense to have the battery spawn in already on the charging station, or at least near it. But what do I know, I'm not a game designer. Number 56, Ihen A Shrine Mid-Air Perch. This would introduce us the Hoverstone Zone Edifice, which is just in time for the Water Temple, since the shrine is located in Mifa Court that you go to before the water temple, which as expected uses hoverstones. Anyway, since it does focus on them, I'm surprised the shrine isn't called a floating device. In case you haven't noticed, a ton of zona devices have a dedicated shrine to them called a blank device. We had a sliding device for sleds, an uplifting device for balloons, and a flying device for wings. There is no dedicated shrine like that for hoverstones, but this shrine pretty much is that, which is why I'm confused about the name. Getting into the actual shrine, it's good. The first puzzle is super simple as it should be since it introduces the concept, and the second and third puzzles has you attach a big bridge to a hoverstone and then put it at an angle, showing you that they still float when stuff is attached to them and even if they aren't oriented straight. The last puzzle is really cool because it originally stumped me. You have to bring an orb across a big gap and you can hit a switch to make a horizontal launcher go off. I originally had no idea what you had to do in my first playthrough, so I made a bridge out of hoverstones with a ramp at the end, which eventually did work after adding enough stones, and I even tried that again this playthrough, but then I suddenly had the idea to put a hoverstone in front of the launcher, and... <laughs> yeah, that blew my mind. I had no idea they kept momentum like that. Needless to say, I think that if a shrine can surprise me like that on my second go, I think it's pretty good by default. It's also just fun to shoot yourself across the gap like that with the orb. The bonus chest sucks a lot though. You literally just have to do the same thing as the first puzzle that introduces the concept. Either make a bridge or ascend through a hoverstone. Thanks, I almost forgot what they do. Number 55, Eun Orok Shrine, the right roll. This is just bowling with a big target on the wall instead of pins to knock down but you're given an extra ball to work with each time to compensate for the wacky terrain, which is a pretty novel idea. First is just a straight shot with one ball of course, but after that you get two balls and a double sided slant going down. I feel like no matter how you do this the balls are gonna move a bit wonky, which is funny. The third and final ball is actually somewhat challenging. With the previous two the correct answer was pretty obvious, but here you get three balls of different sizes and the terrain is just a curve. You could totally just use two balls or something, I feel like there's a couple ways to succeed here. I eventually got it by doing what I initially tried, but a ways already down the hill. Also fun fact, you can just fuse an orb to your weapon and throw it. That's pretty funny. The bonus chest is kinda whatever, you just make some sort of stairs with the three balls to get to it, it's fine. One thing I quickly want to bring up is that this shrine is located in a cave and you have to do a lot of digging through rocks to get to it. Moshepin Shrine, which was a blessing I ranked poorly at number 116, had its main focus be digging through rocks, which rewarded you with a Blessing Shrine. So this shrine also featuring digging through a lot of rocks, but not giving you a blessing, just makes Moshepin Shrine feel like even more of a waste of time if you ask me. Number 54, Morok Shrine, a bouncy device. By the name you'd probably assume this one focuses on the Spring Zone device, and you'd be right, but for some reason it starts with a standard launch you have to take to get to the first spring? This is the only standard launcher in the shrine, so that's just kind of random. I guess it might be to introduce the concept of momentum being a thing, which doesn't seem like something that has to be introduced. Anyway, springs are a basic zona device. You hit them and they create some strong force, like a spring, you get it. But they do some cool stuff with it, like having the second use be a diagonal one, which takes you to a platform over a big gap that has a shrine orb you gotta bring back. And how would you do that? Why, by putting another spring at an angle and launching it back, of course. I like that there's a giant concave area around the orb goal, cause if you wait long enough, the orb will just roll into it, so you can pretend like you got a hole in one. Cool. I also really like that this doesn't open the door to the exit, but instead just more springs for you to use. 
you get two stacked on each other, which would obviously launch you higher than one spring, but you still won't go high enough, so you gotta remember the other spring you used to get over to the orb, and stack that one on top to have the launching power of three springs to finally get to the end, which is just fun to do. I also think it's clever that just using two springs first doesn't waste your time as it gets you to the bonus chest, but that kinda makes it feel like you don't have to think about how to get the chest, you're just kinda handed it. Even if you immediately used three springs, you could just float down to get it. Number 53, Wow Ost Shrine Lever Power. Coincidentally, this one is also about launching something. You're given a plank that can rotate, a heavy cube, a metal ball, a cup, and a target on the wall you obviously have to hit with the ball. So you make a simple launcher with the plank and the cup, which you can power by dropping the cube on the other side. You most likely won't get a direct hit on the first target, but that's okay because it'll roll down onto it, giving you another plank to work with so you can try for the second target, which you do need to get a direct hit with. Cool design evolution. I also like that if you do the obvious thing, which is to just extend your current launcher with the new plank and put the cup on the end again, you'll actually overshoot. You instead have to put the cup on the middle of the extension plank, which will get you a direct hit. In fact, I got a bullseye. Nice. After this, you have to launch Link himself to get to the exit, which is pretty fun to do, obviously. I like that they didn't just have the exit open up on the side or something. Bonus chest is kind of a bad just notice it chest, which you then also have to launch Link for. Pretty generic. One other thing I want to mention is that this shrine is actually tied to a shrine quest, namely the White Bird's Guidance, in which an NPC tells you that while she was up on the long pointed rock formation above Rito Village during the break of dawn, she could see a white bird resting on the tip of its shadow, and that she found a cave entrance nearby said white bird. This translates to you having to go up to the spire at 6am, cause that's the break of dawn, and if you do so, you'll see what looks like a white bird outline in the snow where the tip of the shadow is, and that's how you're supposed to find the cave entrance. That's a really clever puzzle for a shrine quest, so I'm surprised it didn't result in a blessing shrine considering there are other blessing shrines that are just in caves not tied to quests. It's also a cool callback to a similar shrine quest from Breath of the Wild, where you also had to spot a white bird outline in the snow to find a shrine, though that one was way harder to be fair. Number 52, Mayak Shrine, Timely Catches. This shrine is based on hitting a switch, which will briefly make a big bun slide into a position and then slide back. So you have to roll a ball down on top of it, and then time the switch hit so that the ball lands on the big bun. That's the main idea. The first puzzle was super easy, so you think for the second one the ball will just take a more elaborate route to where the bun should be, but no, you instead have to drop it from insanely high up, which is such a cool subversion of expectation, and it just sounds fun to do right on the face of it. So you get Link all the way up there with a couple of launchers, roll the ball from a pretty short slant, and then rush your way back down to hit the bun, and I got this at just about the last frame that would have been possible first try. Nice. Solid shrine with a fun idea. The bonus chest is good too. It's hanging from a rope which isn't too hard to see since astute players are likely to notice it since they have to look up for the shrine anyways, so it's not really a just notice it chest. An arrow from a standard bow can't reach the rope on the chest easily, so you have to launch Link and shoot it from mid-air, which is also pretty fun and gives you another excuse to interact with the launchers. Very well thought out. Number 51, Seru Tabomak Shrine, The Way Up. So right at the start, the shrine has a lot to live up to, since this is the shrine located at Hyrule Castle, making it the only shrine in the entire game that's actually in a dungeon, instead of on the way to one. And if you remember, we're doing every shrine when you're supposed to, which in this case means the shrine is only intended to be reached after you've cleared the other main four dungeons in the game, since that's when you're supposed to go to Hyrule Castle. Anyways, getting into the actual shrine, it's good. It has a pretty basic theme, you just have to make platforms on bars and put them in such a way that they stay upright for you to ascend through, but I think they actually made the solution somewhat tricky. The first one obviously isn't, you literally just put a plank on two bars, but that's to be expected for the first puzzle. The second one I actually remembered struggling with on my first playthrough. I couldn't figure out that what you're supposed to do is make an L shape and balance it between the bar and the wall like this. I'm pretty sure I ended up cheesing this one in my first playthrough. The last puzzle is interesting because the bars are far apart, so that immediately cuts your options down by a lot. This is another one of those puzzles where it almost feels like there is no intended solution, and I had to sit there for a bit to think of what to do. I ended up making this funky shape that I could use to ascend through twice. Maybe that is intended, but it's still something that makes you feel smart for figuring it out. The bonus chest is cool too because it's high up and in front of spikes, so not only do you have to make something you can ascend through, but also something that provides safe ground to stand on, 
which makes you keep both sides of whatever you're gonna make in mind. Number 50, Joe Uu Shrine Building Bridges. It's based on, surprise, bridges that you build with. The first bridge is just intact, and the second one is broken, but there's still one segment of it hanging on the other side, so you can pick up what's remaining and attach it to there, so you can get across. The next puzzle has the same idea, but the bridge is too long. Why'd they even build it like that? Anyways, you have to attach a different segment of it to the end. Pretty basic puzzle evolution. After that, you don't attach the bridge to a broken segment, but instead to a heavy cube so you can drape it over a pole. Also pretty clever. And then the last bridge is just also completely intact, and you can just walk to the end. Which I find hilarious for some reason. But you do have to interact with it in a unique way by attaching the side of a segment to a broken bridge, in order to get to the bonus chest. Pretty clever as well. One thing I can appreciate this shrine for is that there are two random bridges that don't serve a purpose in terms of puzzles, but it adds to the vibe of the shrine. It's almost like it tells a small story, that at some point in the distant past, all the bridges in here were just intact, but they broke down later down the line, which you have to fix in order to beat it. I'm probably reading too much into that, but this is an idea that other shrines don't really tackle, which is fine, it makes sense for shrines to be built literally just as puzzle gauntlets made for Link specifically, but it still makes this shrine somewhat special, at least to me. Number 49, Oromuak Shrine, a launching device. This one is based on rockets, a fan favorite Zona device. It's kind of weird that the first puzzle has to launch a rocket into a target, since the rest of the shrine doesn't have any targets and instead focuses on attaching rockets to minecarts. But that concept in itself is pretty funny because that's not a conventional use for rockets. But then again, neither is launching them into targets. The last puzzle has you launch yourself with a minecart again, but this time it's not on rails and instead just through the air over a big gap. Which is not only fun, but also teaches the player that rockets can carry momentum without needing some sort of ground to be on like with the previous puzzle. Like I said, this is fun, but I do have a gripe with this shrine. The bonus chest is terrible. Not only is it a dumb, just notice it lol, chest, but once you get there, which is finicky since putting rockets on the nearby minecart will make you get stuck on the ceiling first, but once you get it, you're high up enough to have an extremely easy glide over to the end, completely skipping the last puzzle. So if anyone happens to notice the chest first and go for it, they might skip the last part on accident, and if they notice it last, going back to it is kind of unsatisfying since you just solved the last puzzle and now you're essentially unsolving it, if that makes sense. Still a good shrine though, I just think it should have had a completely different bonus chest. This is a good, or I guess bad example of how a really bad bonus chest can clash with one of the main puzzles and bring the overall shrine's quality down a bit. Number 48, Tosu Mamu Shrine, a balanced plan. This is our first real shrine that's based on solving a physics-based puzzle. And guess what? I love physics-based puzzles. And I mean, yeah, we've had puzzles before that feature the physics engine, obviously, but this is the first one where I feel like it really makes you think about real-life physics, which is what I mean primarily. First you encounter a platform that has a bit more weight on the side that's away from the ledge you have to get on, so you gotta run and jump at the last moment. And then you get the same idea but it's a lot steeper, so you gotta weigh down the other side with a metal barrel. Now here's where the real good physics puzzle comes in. There's another weighted platform like that, but the side that leads to the exit has three heavy cubes stuck to it, and you're only given one cube and a plank to work with, so what do you do? Well, you put the cube on one of the ends of the plank, and then put the other end of the plank on the side of the skill that doesn't have the three cubes. Since even though three cubes weigh more than one, because the one cube is further away from the point where the skill rotates, it'll still outweigh the three cubes. There's probably a more scientific way to explain this phenomenon, but I'm not smart enough for that, and you probably get what I mean anyways. Man, I love physics puzzles. One thing that's worth noting though is that this shrine is probably way too easy to cheese with recall. I don't know how they could have prevented this other than just removing your recall ability in this shrine, which would have gone against the game's philosophy of letting players find their own solutions, so I won't hold it against the shrine too much. Also the bonus chest is just fine. You put the plank without the cube on the side of the skill like this so you can get to it. Not too crazy, but also not what you'd immediately think to do, probably. Number 47, Joku Usen Shrine, Proven Grounds, Short Circuit. So before getting into the actual shrine, remember from part 1 when I said I wasn't a fan of that one blessing on Dragonet Island that just acts as a fast travel point to retry the fatality door there? This is that other shrine I mentioned that's close by enough to also act as a fast travel point for it. Just thought I'd mention that. Anyway, since it's on the Thunderhead Isles, this Proven Grounds is based on electricity, which is pretty cute. At first there's just some standard combat which is just kinda whatever, but then you're given three shock fruits and a set of archers standing on metal platforms, for which you're obviously intended to fuse shock fruits to your arrows and shoot set metal platforms to conduct the lightning. 
Technically, you could just headshot the construct with regular arrows and have the same results of them dying, but this is more fun and fits with the theme, so who cares. After that, there are a couple more constructs by a ring of metal tiles, and one of them has more health, so it won't die from just shocking the floor with your last shock fruit. But if you glide over them, there's a shock emitter that you can drop on the tiles, which will slowly kill them, and that's just really funny to watch. Not a very challenging proven grounds at all, but its theme is executed really well. Much better than some other proven grounds we've had. Number 46, Tukarok Shrine, Forward Force. Okay, this shrine is pretty infamous for being an easy example of something this game supposedly does poorly, but I'll get into that when we get to it. For now, just know the shrine is based around transporting a giant orb through the whole thing. The first puzzle is just kind of whatever, drive it over some lava with a pre-built car, woo. But the second puzzle is fantastic. You're faced with this seemingly random assortment of barred slanted walls, a wheel, a sliding block, and a plank. What in God's name are you supposed to do? Well, honestly, I don't know what the intended solution is, but what I came up with was putting the wheel on the side of the sliding cube, the plank on the wheel like this, and the ball on the cube as well, obviously. So that when I activate it, this would happen. This is such a cool solution if I do say so myself, and I'm really proud of coming up with it. Next is the infamous part I mentioned. The last puzzle is yet another one without a clear intended solution, as there's a big body of water flowing in your direction, with a raft that has some wheels on the side, and you're given a couple planks. I swear I've seen this exact puzzle in like three different videos talking about how it's not fun to get a solution to a puzzle that's clearly unintended, but kinda works anyways. And I'm gonna say, huh? The entire point of this game is to figure out your own solutions, and personally I think it's an awesome feeling to find those personal solutions to problems, even if they do look a bit wonky sometimes. The intended solution is probably to put two planks on the sides of the wheel so it can paddle the raft forward like this, since that also works on the previous puzzle and now that I think about it is probably the intended solution for that one as well, but doing that here makes the raft go forward super slowly. So I can see people trying that, seeing how slow it is, and then think that's not what you're supposed to do. Hence why I've seen so many people do the same thing I did here. You could argue that makes this a badly designed puzzle, and yeah, maybe it is on a technical level, but overcoming something like this in your own wacky way is just fun, and I love this shrine because of it. And also because that second puzzle is just really, really good on its own. But there is one bad thing I can say about this shrine, and you probably already know what it is. The bonus chest is awful. It's just sitting in the water by the third puzzle, and you have to notice it. Cool, dude. Number 45, Yochisiu Shrine, Bro's Blessing. Hey, it's been a while since we had a blessing. Anyways, for this one, you just have to solve one of those classic Zelda riddles. A construct that's sitting by some weird-looking pillars with diamond shapes on the wall gives you the riddle, Give keys born of water to the three altars. The sacred shrine will appear. And I don't know about you guys, but this is super vague in my opinion. Like, what the hell does that mean? which is exactly what riddles should make you think. If you talk to the construct again after getting the quest, it'll add on the hint that water can sometimes change its form, which is a good hint because it definitely helps you get closer to the answer without outright spoiling it. The solution is that you have to go to a nearby river, which has some rockets and frost emitters laying by it. Use those to freeze the water, which makes square plates made of ice appear, which you have to tilt on its side and carry over to the pillars by the construct, where you can slot them in. There are two other diamond shapes that are smaller than the biggest one, which might stump you, but because the river is a bit far away from the pillars, you'll notice while carrying the ice that it slowly melts over time, which would obviously make it shrink, and there are some flame emitters nearby to let you shrink them faster. And on top of that, you also have to actually try to get them to the right size, since there are two you gotta slot in that are smaller than the default one. I just think keys made from water alluding to ice is genius, and I really didn't consider that. It's also smart how this is by what looks like an abandoned Zonai ruin of some sort, so it makes sense that there would be some random Zonai devices laying around. You don't need rockets at all, but them being here makes it not so obvious that there are also frost emitters by the water. If there is one negative thing I can say about this shrine is that I can totally see players getting here before learning that freezing water creates specifically square-shaped ice blocks like this, but it really doesn't take much experimentation to figure that out, so I don't think it's a big deal. Number 44, Ishadok Shrine, a windy device. With a name like that, it's obvious that this one is a showcase for the fan Zonai device, which is in my opinion the single most versatile device in the game, and thus it's important to learn all the different ways you can work with them. So how good of a job does this shrine do at that? Well first you need to put one on its back and use it to fly up a ledge, showing you that they can create updrafts. Standard, but a good start. After that you put one on its side to show that they can propel stuff. In this case a boat. 
This one is a little less good because that's the exact way you learn to use them in the required tutorial, but still fine enough. Then comes the main meat of this shrine, and let's discuss the amazingly creative bonus chest here first. It's stuck on the side of a plank that you can obviously rotate, so you put a fan on the opposite side so it can rotate the plank upwards in such a way that the chest not only stands upright, but also that you can ascend through the other side of the plank. This is already really smart, but one thing I like a lot is that after you attach the fan, you can see the plank move a little bit, subtly teaching you that fans themselves can add weight to builds, which is of course important to know. After that you have to make an elevator go up with fans, but attaching only one fan to it, which you're likely to do if you just use the other one for the bonus chest, doesn't make it go upwards. So you have to pluck the other fan from before to reuse it for the elevator, teaching you that using multiple fans on something makes the pushing effect of the wind stronger. Which might sound super obvious, but this isn't the case for every Sona device like with rockets, where using multiple of them doesn't make their effect stronger, so it's still important to know for sure. So this shrine does a pretty good job of teaching you how fans work, both in an obvious way and a more subtle way. And besides that, I just think it's a fun shrine, and the bonus chest is especially creative. Nice stuff. I could see some thinking I'm ranking this one too high, but it's my list, and I like it. Number 43, Rasiwak Shrine Flotational Brilliance. This one is based on these yellow balls that float on water. At the start, there's this bridge you have to lower and then somehow use the floating ball to get over to the other side. At first I thought you had to launch the platform somehow while Link was on it, but no. You're supposed to stick the ball to the side of the platform so it stays in the perfect spot for you to get across. I'm glad I figured this out because the rest of the shrine also focuses on just making stuff float with the balls, like the next puzzle where you have to do essentially the same thing, but with a platform that will fling you in the wrong direction if you do try to launch Link with it, so you also just make it float on the ball. The last puzzle has you make a boat that floats thanks to those balls. I like this one because there's probably a couple different ways you could do that, but this is how I did it. After that you have to put the boat on this big bun to open the door, and at first I didn't realize why they would make you do that, but then I realized it's so that you can't just swim to the other side without the boat, which is a very clever way of making sure players at least engage with the shrine puzzles. Good shrine, but one thing I want to mention is that this is a contender for one of the worst bonus chests. Literally all you have to do is cross the water with the boat like normal, except a little more to the left. Wow, that's so hard, I don't know how I figured that one out. Number 42, Timawak Shrine Against the Flow. Sticking with the theme of crossing lakes, this shrine focuses on getting over lava lakes with obsidian slabs. Or stone slabs. Whatever. Minecraft taught me that any kind of solid material made by putting water on top of lava is obsidian, so I'm gonna keep calling it obsidian. First, you just cross a lava lake with some basic obsidian slabs. Not that deep, but it's important to note that the slabs float across the flowing lava instead of being stationary, since the shrine focuses on moving slabs specifically. After that comes a quick fight against the construct, which doesn't really serve a purpose at all. Man, these random useless fight sections are like whack-a-mole, I never know when they're gonna pop up. There's an orb goal here and you can see the orb across some lava flowing against the direction you have to go. Obsidian slabs are being created at the end of this flowing lava, so you gotta get on a slab and recall it to get to the orb. The bonus chest is also at the end here and I really like it. You'd think you just have to get on a slab and recall it again, but the slabs are created far enough away from the chest that you can't reach it like that. So instead you have to move a slab with ultra hands to be closer to the chest and then let it float back to you, so you can recall it and reach the chest. Very clever. After this comes my favorite part. You have to get up to some hydrants by using a fan, so that you can make your own obsidian slab. Then put a fan on top of it, to make a little obsidian boat to reach the end. Again, it's not that deep, but it's fun. There are two different shapes obsidian slabs can take when created, so this is going to be slightly different for 50% of players, which is neat. Remember that bad crystal blessing from way earlier in the ranking, where at the end you had to also make an obsidian boat to cross some lava? I didn't like it there, cause most of that shrine was just spent digging out rocks, which sucks. Here it's well done because it's in an actual shrine that's entirely focused on these slabs, so it feels like a natural progression of the concept. Instead of what that crystal blessing did, where it just kinda feels tacked on at the end, since most of that shrine had nothing to do with those slabs. Number 41, Mayachin Shrine, a fixed device. This is the baseball shrine, and I have personal beef for this one. So the idea is super simple. You just have to make a baseball bat with some sticks and stakes, and then hit this rolling ball into a target on the wall by hitting this switch at the right time which makes your bat spin 180 degrees, and hitting it opens the door to the exit. What you can also do is slightly more challenging take at this for the bonus chest, where you first have to move and keep this hanging plank out of the way with a stake, and then swing the bat with different and slightly harder timing. 
like I said, it's a very simple shrine and it is pretty fun. But the reason I have beef with it is because on my first playthrough, this legit took me like 20 tries. But then when I did it here for this video, I got it first try. And the one for the bonus chest, second try. The reason I sucked so much at this is because at the start of the shrine, you randomly have to cross this rotating platform first that's in the same kind of spinning device as the bat. So for some reason, I thought you had to take that platform and make the bat out of it. So just for the heck of it, I tried that again here after clearing the shrine already, and then I got it second try as well. So I was mentally defeated and just continued on to the end. Obviously, me being bad at this shrine the first time I did it doesn't ruin it for me at all. But I just thought it was fun to mention, as there otherwise isn't a whole lot to say about the shrine. It's just pretty good. Number 40, Jakai's Shrine, Jailbreak. This shrine is pretty basic, but it has some twists that make it stand out. First of all, you have to make it up a huge ledge, for which you're only given 4 seemingly random sliding blocks at the base. You have to put the blocks in such a way that you can navigate them with the use of ascent to this little window here, so you can get to the top. I like that you don't really need the bottom right block, making it kind of a red herring, which the game sadly doesn't do often. After that, the second puzzle admittedly isn't that hard. All you have to do is put a plank in such a way that you can stand on it and ascend through a pillar above. Now, you'd probably expect the shrine to be over at that point, but no. You're instead put in a jill that you have to find your way out of, which is a really cool and unexpected twist. It's also not immediately apparent how you get out, but there's a plank nearby that you have to balance on one of the corners of the cell, so you can ascend into it and escape. I just really like that this shrine goes on for a bit longer than you'd initially expect. The bonus chest is awful though. It's yet another, just notice it behind you lol chest. There isn't even an interesting puzzle or whatever, you just stand under it and use the scent. Really cool bro. Number 39, Osho Sanu Shrine, Mallet Smash. This one is very creative and well executed. There's a target on the wall next to a sliding stone on the adjacent wall. You get a log and a rocket, and you have to make the log slam into the target. Boom, pretty easy. Here's the interesting part. The second and also last puzzle has the same general concept, hit a target with a lock, but you're given a wheel to work with instead of a stone that slides on a rail, and also two differently sized locks, so you have to make some kind of rocket powered hammer this time. Pretty simple to figure out, but I feel like there's a couple of ways you could go about this, which is always neat. I really like that the two puzzles have the same goal, but you reach them differently, once with a sliding rock and once with a spinning wheel. I wish there was just one more puzzle, because there's gotta be more ways to design puzzles with this idea, right? The bonus chest kinda sucks though. You have to climb the bigger lock to get up to it, which is made a little too obvious because of the indent in the wall. Man, we really haven't had a good bonus chest in a while, huh? Luckily, that's about to change with... Number 38. Geosyn Shrine Shape Rotation. You ever see that TikTok that goes like, that's right, it goes in the square hole? Well, this is that. At first, you have to get this weirdly shaped three segmented piece through this X-shaped hole, and it's pretty easy to figure out since this is of course just to introduce the concept. But they actually do something more with it, which is that they make you use it as a platform to cross the gap here, which I really like. You may think this is just a cute little thing they make you do for fun, but it's actually to set up the concept of using these pieces as platforms since the shrine does more of that later. The second piece is this mold of two squares, and it's also pretty easy to figure out how to get them through the hole. But then after that, you gotta figure out how to place it along these steps to make a staircase for you to reach the bonus chest. And after that, you have to use the same object again to get it through this shape. And I'm pretty embarrassed to admit that this took me longer than it should have. Eventually I got it though, cause I'm a big boy. Finally, after that, you have to again use this object as a staircase, which is a bit easier to figure out than the one for the bonus chest in my opinion, but that's fine. I really like how this shrine first sets you up to expect it to just be about rotating shapes to fit into specific holes, which I mean it does do, but then it also focuses on placing those shapes in specific ways so you can use them as platforms, which still fits the shrine's name of shape rotation. Very cool design. Number 37, Makasura Shrine, an upright device, focuses on stabilizers, which is a really cool Zona device, so this ought to be good, right? It's based around stabilizers attached to these huge plates that obviously stand upright when you activate the stabilizer. You're supposed to make the first one just stand upright so you can climb it and use that height to glide across a gap. But I didn't realize that and used it to launch Link instead, which hey, still worked. And after that, you do have to climb one to make it over some bars, so it's fine. I still had to do it anyways. On the other side of the cell is a shrine orb and another one of those planks with a cup at the end, making it obvious that you have to launch the orb over the bars, which is supposed to give players the idea Link can also be launched like this, which you have to do for the bonus chest here. 
very smart design. I also love that getting this orb doesn't result in you clearing the shrine, but instead just gives you another plank with a cup so that you can attach it to the other one, the launch link with way more momentum over a huge gap. That's awesome. Also, I would be remiss not to mention that this shrine, which is called an upright device in which you make tall pillars erect upwards, was the 69 shrine I did in this playthrough, by pure coincidence. And also by pure coincidence, I wasn't wearing any armor during it. Uh, nice. Number 36, Masanokir Shrine, Swing to Hit. This one has a very specific mechanic, namely attaching small balls to big cubes. Sounds super random, but the shrine does some cool stuff with it. First, you have to attach a ball that's stuck to a drawbridge to a loose cube, which doesn't work if you do it near the top of the cube, but does work if you do it near the bottom of the cube, because physics. Awesome. Then there's this ball hanging on a chain that doesn't reach a target if you just swing it. So you gotta attach the cube from before to it so that it does, which in turn conditions you to believe that you somehow have to hit the next target with a cube as well, but you can try all you want, you probably won't succeed. Instead you have to attach the nearby lock to the top of this sliding platform, and then the cube once again to the ball that's hanging from it, so that you can swing it to create momentum for the platform to slide forward, and hit the target with the lock. I struggle to decide if this is bad design because you're made to believe you can only hit those targets with cubes, or good design because it forces you to reconsider your strategy. It's probably fine though since there are plenty of other shrines where you have to hit a target with something other than a cube. But then again, any shrine could be someone's first, so I don't know. The bonus chest here is actually good though. Its seemingly random placement makes me think that there's no intended solution, which is of course always cool. I ended up using the lock to climb up the cube and then attach the same lock to the cube so I could cross it like a bridge, which was still very satisfying to figure out. One last thing I want to mention, do you remember near the bottom of the ranking how I said that it made sense for the shrine at the end of the climb up to the wind temple to be a blessing shrine? Because players wouldn't want to be derailed for a random shrine puzzle after such a cool high building moment. Well this shrine kinda does have that problem, because it's placed in the hub of Korok Forest, and if you remember, the first time you get there it's all dark and gloomy, and the Koroks are all creepily frozen in place. I can totally see players be excited to figure out what's going on in Korok Forest, only to be derailed by this shrine for a good bit. This is a rare case where I would have understood this being a blessing shrine for fast travel purposes. Maybe they could have swapped it with one of those random blessings that really shouldn't be a blessing, like that stupid one in the Gerudo Highlands that's just sitting out in the open. Number 35, Sitsum Shrine, a controlling device. This one has a lot to live up to because it's the steering stick showcase, which is probably the single most important zone of device and also hands down the best one in the game. It's not as versatile as the fan, but you can't deny its importance. Since it's such a commonly used zone of device, this shrine based around it easily could have fallen into the trap of being too generic. But right off the bat, the first thing you do is drive a cart over some lava, which isn't the first thing that comes to mind when I think about steering sticks. And it's smart too because it forces you to engage with the sticks as there really isn't any other way to cross the lava otherwise. Unless you throw water on it I guess, but again we're banning outside materials. After that you cross some lava and you get to run over an enemy, who sadly doesn't die from it but hey it does show you that vehicles you move with steering sticks can deal damage, that's pretty neat. And then finally there's a flying machine for the end. It doesn't have a steering stick so you have to pluck it from the cart, showing you that you can obviously reuse those as well. There's a pillar you have to dodge and then a white turn you have to make, so if you didn't grab the steering stick for this flying machine, you'd have a much harder time getting to the end. If I can say something negative about this shrine though, to get the bonus chest you have to drive into this tight gap here to get a shrine orb, and because the cart is too wide to turn around, you clearly have to drive in reverse, which is probably meant to teach you that you can also go backwards with steering sticks, which is all well and good, but because the cart is so wide, Trying to go in reverse will most likely make the wheels try to roll up them and get stuck, so the most optimal way out of here is to just recall the cart, which isn't as engaging, and doesn't really teach you anything either. Also while it doesn't matter for the ranking, this shrine is right before the Moragia fight, for which you definitely have to use a steering stick, so it's smartly placed too, as this could obviously be some players' first real exposure to them, as you can do the dungeons in any order. Number 34, Josiu Shrine, Rose Blessing. Again, remember way earlier in the ranking when I talked smack about a crystal shrine where you had to move a bridge in place with Ultra Hand and that was it? Back then I said that there's a shrine later on that does that same gimmick way better, and this is that shrine. 
Once again, after activating the empty shrine pedestal, you see that the crystal is on another nearby sky island directly across from you this time. And the shape of the bridge doesn't allow you to simply connect the island with the crystal to the one with the shrine so you can just walk across it. The intended way to clear this is probably to connect the bridge to the island on the side like this, glide under the island with the crystal so you can ascend to it, bring the crystal to the side island, and then connect the bridge with the main island again so you can simply walk the last bit. This alone would already make it more interesting than that last time, but the way I did it was that I rotated the bridge to stand upright and lined it up with the crystal island, placed the crystal down on the tip of the bridge, then went back to the ultra hand device and turned the bridge to face me, so that the crystal would roll across the bridge and to where it has to go. I felt really smart for this, and the concave area on the side of the bridge leads me to believe this was also intended to be one of the solutions, which is really cool if true. Now that would have been it, but while recording the script for this video, I suddenly got curious to know if recall would somehow also work here, and it does. You can recall the ultra hand apparatus to which the bridge obviously reacts when it moves, which is an awesome way to solve this shrine as well. And it's obviously intended since recall works in the first place. So this shrine has three cool and interesting ways of solving it. Fantastic use of these apparatus things. Anyways, my god. Those were all the 38 shrines I rated a 7 out of 10 in my notes, meaning that we're nearing the end of the list now. From here on out, every shrine is really good, so buckle in for some high quality, especially as we're near the tippy top of the list, obviously. Number 33, Runakit Shrine, built to carry. This is another one of those that focuses on bringing one big orb through the whole thing, but this time via rails, which means that you get to do some sick shield grinding. Yeah. The second time you do this, the rails are too far apart and you're given two small poles to work with, so you gotta put them on the orb in a way that'll let it slide down no problem. I wish that they made these rails curve a little bit, because technically the way I put the poles made it so that it could still fall through the rails if it turned a bit, which it didn't because it's a straight shot forward, but it's not a big deal I suppose. The last part is my favorite though, it's only one rail this time and you're given just a bunch of random plates with corners, and it feels like another one of those puzzles that doesn't have a clear solution, which I of course love. Speaking of no clear solution though, the bonus chest. It's on a platform that you have to climb a ladder for that you can only get to via a rail that eventually splits into a different rail, and I have no idea what the hell you're even supposed to do here. Maybe I'm just an idiot and there is an obvious solution I'm not seeing, but I really love this bonus chest because it felt so random and overcoming it in my own way was really satisfying. Number 32, an Oma Shrine, Rose Blessing. Okay, honestly, it's kinda dumb that I rate this one so highly, but I just really like it for some reason. This is that one crystal blessing in a cave that you get to via the giant whirlpool in Lake Hylia. You probably see this whirlpool many times from the Sky Islands before you actually decide to investigate, and you probably also already expect a shrine to be your reward somehow, but activating that empty shrine pedestal and seeing the line go straight up, only for you to get out of the cave and see that it still goes straight up all the way to a Sky Island, is just so funny to me, and I don't know how to explain why. I also like that there's no obvious way to get to the Sky Island. You could either use the Skyview Tower that's somewhat nearby and make a big paraglider trip, or you could warp to the Great Sky Island and use a wing from there. It's up to you. Even sky biking up there is a valid option, obviously. When you get there and see the crystal sitting in front of a hole on the floor, it's pretty obvious that you have to drop it through there and then dive after it, which is just really fun. After that, the crystal is laying in front of the shrine and you're free to clear it. Like I said, I just really like it for no real reason, to be honest. One thing I want to say that bugged me about this shrine though is that I like to play open world games without fast traveling at all, but sadly it is impossible to get out of this whirlpool cave without warping away. No matter where you ascend, you will always end up in the whirlpool and you cannot swim fast enough to get out, even with buffs. Trust me, I tried for a very long time on my first playthrough. Obviously that doesn't ruin the shrine for me or anything, but damn it did leave a very bad taste in my mouth. Watching the hero's path of my first playthrough warp here and pretty much nowhere else just kinda stinks, you know? Number 31, Susuyai Shrine, a spinning device. This is a showcase for those small automated wheels, and I like that they make you use them in unconventional ways, which honestly at this point is par for the course for these a blank device shrines. First you see how the device works instead of making you use it yourself, which is pretty rare but fine. Sadly though, it does lead to a pretty bad bonus chest, it's not hard to see it drive by at all and just pluck it away. After that, you recreate one of those cards you just saw, which I definitely did not struggle with, because I definitely do not think those small wheels are a nightmare to attach to objects the exact way you want them to. And then you drive over a rolling hill, which takes a while, but it's pretty cool. 
Here is where the actual unconventional uses come in though. There's one of those spinny levers that opens the door forwards, but it closes if you stop spinning. So you gotta attach a wheel to it to make it keep spinning. Very weird use that would only work with automated wheels, which is also cool. After that there's a platform on some rails, and you gotta make it go forward somehow with wheels of course. I feel like with the shape of the platform, especially because of the big hole right here, you can do this in a couple different ways. But I did it like this. Again, a very unique way of using wheels. I dig it. Number 30, Sakusu Shrine, Proven Grounds, Ascension. Okay, this is obviously not a blessing, but it's one of those rare cases where I feel like you have to judge what you do before the shrine as well, because it's pretty surprising that this isn't a blessing, honestly. It starts on a sky island above Mount Lineru, where there is one of those wall panels that when activated, spawns a circle that you obviously have to snowboard into because of the ramp in front of it. Then it drops another circle all the way down on the mountain, and from there more spawn, each on a timer, giving you a cool little snowboarding section here, which is obviously very fun. Once you're done with it, a shrine spawns, and this is where the proving grounds is. Like how is that not a blessing, but the stupid one that's literally just out in the open is, or the one that's just in a well. If we judge by those standards, then it's completely fair to expect this one to be a blessing because of the snowboarding segment, not to mention having to climb Mount Oneru to get to the Skyview Tower at the top, which leads to the Sky Islands this starts on. Anyways, getting into the actual shrine now, this Proven Grounds' theme isn't really based on something combat related, but more so on the fact that it's very vertical, and there are many different ways to make your way up, so many that it's almost overwhelming. There's this sliding platform on a rail that you can recall, you can ascend through the bridges from the bridges below them, you can go up slowly via a hot air balloon, and there's even a little laser room with rockets in them for blasting up with rocket shields or something. The combat isn't very unique here because again the theme isn't combat oriented, but it's fun to take the verticality into account, for example by jumping off the top and using bullet time. It's not the most unique proven grounds, but it's fun enough, and the surprise snowboarding before it definitely helps it out a bit too. If that wasn't there, this shrine would have ranked quite a bit lower, I think. Number 29, Mogisari Shrine, Courage to Jump. This low gravity shrine is based around driving a cart across a long series of across a long series of tracks filled with obstacles like lava spikes on the floor and even enemies shooting arrows at you. What's funny to me is that none of the obstacles really change the track in a meaningful way at all, because you can just drive over the spikes, drive through the laser emitters, and the enemies can't hit a target if their life depended on it. At least the lava slows you down a little bit, but it's only placed at the very start, so it doesn't really matter. If there was lava close by some enemies, it might have helped them land a shot. Maybe. I don't think it's a big deal though, because the main enjoyment of this shrine is just driving the car through this track, and I think that's really fun. At the end, you even get to attach rockets to your car to fly over this big gap. Look at this sick drift I did at the finish line. Awesome. Like I said, this shrine is a lot of fun, but there is one part that kinda sucks. The road splits in two at some point, but the left one, which I feel most players will automatically gravitate towards, is the path that has the bonus chest, which you not only have no way of knowing beforehand, but it's also behind two breakable blocks, which you think would be fun to smash through with your cart, but you're extremely likely to only break one of them and have the other one completely kill your momentum, which is super unsatisfying. This is also a contender for worst bonus chest in the game if you ask me, because not only is it essentially luck based if you even pick the track that has it, but it's also not fun to collect at all. The two split paths should have just been combined to make the main track a bit longer and more varied, and there should have just been one breakable block instead of two, so that you would just drive through it, which would also add some challenge to getting the bonus chest as you'd have to spot it while driving over it. Number 28, Maya CR Shrine, Roro's Blessing. Speaking of low gravity shrines, this one is in one of those big hollow orbs in the sky, and it has you solve an elaborate light reflect puzzle by spinning different smaller islands with mirrors on them around. It's a continuous cycle of making the light beam longer, checking how it's traveling and where the next mirror is at the moment, making your way over to it, and then spinning that one so that it shines towards the next mirror again. It doesn't get hard at all at any point, but the challenge does keep increasing as the amount of different light beams also keeps increasing. What's also cool is that halfway through this puzzle, you can optionally point one of the mirrors towards a light panel on the floor to get a chest, making this one of the only blessing shrines that kind of has a bonus chest. I mean, not really, but you know what I mean. My favorite part though is that at the start of all this, the first platform you spin has three light sources shoot out of it, so naturally you just point the one closest to the first mirror in the right direction and then go from there. But at the end, the light beam makes its way to that starting platform, and the mirror on it is pointed in the wrong way as usual. But when you try spinning it, you also move the light source, which in turn gets rid of all the light beams you've made. 
This might confuse you if you forgot that platform is also the origin of the light, but you just gotta keep spinning the island until both the mirror and light source are in the right spot. And when you do all that, the light beams return and the final one is in the right spot, making for a really satisfying moment as the shrine finally appears. Number 27, Mayana Shrine, the Ice Guides You. So remember way earlier in the ranking when I said that Ukujisi Shrine and Taninaut Shrine, which were both Crystal Blessings, were bad because they reused essentially the same Sky Island with two sets of vines and almost the same Zona devices to make a flying machine so you can bring the crystal back. And then I said that there was also a third one that does this? Yeah, guess what? This is that third one. You again make your way over to this reused Sky Island, again cut two sets of vines, again make a pretty standard flying machine with literally the same materials as Ukujisi Shrine, and again bring the crystal back to its pedestal. But what makes this one actually good is that this is not a blessing shrine? Yeah, this is the only shrine in the entire game where you have to bring a crystal to a pedestal that doesn't end up being a Rose blessing. Literally the only one. I even had to make a unique icon for this one ranking spot that has the crystal but not the blessing symbol next to it. That makes the other two like this so confusing. It's essentially the exact same journey, but those two do end up using those journeys as the excuse to justify blessings. So why not this one? If those two copied the homework, this is the student that originally made the homework. Shoutouts to Morgini in my chat for that one. Anyways, getting into the actual shrine, it's based around making slabs of ice with frost emitters or ice fruits, and then sliding those down a slope, over some spikes, and into a moving target. This actually ends the shrine, so it's really short, but there's another puzzle like this past the exit for the bonus chest. Thank god, otherwise this one would've ranked so much lower. This time the slant is at an angle, and the target is covered by some more spikes. Both puzzles have some metal slabs nearby, which I thought were there as a practical joke, since they obviously don't slide like ice, but here I realized that they're there to make the sliding slab bigger, and thus more likely to hit the target. I got the second puzzle first try thanks to them. So yeah, I'm cool is all I'm saying. I really like this shrine, and the fact that it is somehow not a blessing is just more interesting than it is upsetting. Maybe it's ranked a bit too high, but I think it stands out a lot because of that. I mean, if you're that unique out of 152 shrines, you're definitely special in some way, right? Number 26, Mayamat's Shrine, a route for a ball. This is THE use blank in an unconventional way shrine, as it's focused on using this metal ball in ways you normally wouldn't use balls. First you have to place it in this little funnel shape so you can stand under it and ascend through, which is subtly put in the back of your mind as you had to ascend earlier to get up to the ball in the first place. I ragged on a shrine earlier that put ascend in your mind like that, but there it was to remind you to ascend through a standard platform. Most people wouldn't think to ascend through a ball, so I think it works here. After that, you have to recall cancel this orb at the right time so that it falls on some rails and makes its way to you, adding another ball to the mix. Then you have to somehow bring the orb to a lower level with these rails that are too wide, so you grab the metal ball from before, attach it to the orb, and make them slide down together. The first time I did this, the orb let go of the ball pretty much as soon as I grabbed them, so it fell into the void and made it respawn back at the top, making me go back and do it again. It's not a big deal, but I question why this little bottomless pit had to be at the end of the track in the first place. Why not just have it stop against the wall here? I really don't see a reason for this. Anyways, this gets the orb to the goal, ending the shrine. The bonus chest also has to use the metal ball in a weird way, namely as a platform, which is more common of a use for them, but definitely still unconventional, so it's a fitting puzzle for their shrine if you ask me. Number 25, Yochi Ihaga Shrine, Roro's Blessing. This one is just hilarious. This guy in Terrytown has the crystal for the shrine, and in his words, he's looking for some sucker to sell it to. He also says he stole it in the first place, so he's clearly just some dickhead. He tries selling it to Link for 100 rupees, which you can just pay him, but I was actually a little short on money, so I said not for that price, at which point he'll lower the offer to 80 rupees as a one-time deal. If you decline the offer again, his wife will show up to berate him for trying to sell random junk for outrageous prices again, and she tells him that he shouldn't sell it for any more than 50 rupees. This is the lowest the price will go, so you might as well take it. Shoutouts to this saint of a woman right here, she's my goat. After this, you still obviously have to take the crystal to the shrine, which the beam tells you is on the other side of the Terrytown railcard system, which the guy you bought the crystal from normally charges 20 rupees to use, but you can alternatively go through a little quest where you have to go into a little cave below the town to ascend into a storage room to get access to some huts and signs you can use to block the guy's view, so you can ride the card for free. 
After all this, you see that the shrine is across a big body of water, and I really like that even though there are plenty of Zona devices laying around, none of them point towards something obvious to build for this. I ended up making a hovercraft with some tree locks on the side to keep it afloat. It worked, albeit pretty slowly, but it worked. This shrine is not only fun to actually solve, but it's also just a funny interaction with some NPCs that adds a bit of character to both Hyrule and Link. I'm also glad there aren't any more shrines where you just have to go through some dialogue options. Really makes this one stand out, and it could have gotten annoying if this happened more often. Out of all the shrines in the ranking, I feel like people are gonna say I place this one too high the most, but in my eyes it earns its high spot for being the only shrine in the game that's more funny than an actual puzzle, even though it still actually has a pretty good puzzle tied to it. Number 24, my OC shrine, building blocks. At the start you're presented with a completed block on the left and an incompleted block on the right, with some loose blocks in specific shapes that you gotta use to make the right block match the left one. Not too hard to figure out, and it's pretty fun to do too. After this, some gates open in your face with some extremely pointless combat, again. I mean, cool, whatever. But after this is another one of those block matching puzzles that is much harder. It's still not very hard as it didn't take me too long to figure out, and once you've done that you're done, the exit opens up. The bonus chest is also pretty clever as you have to use the building blocks from the second puzzle to make your way up to the platform. I put two on top of each other so I could ascend through and reach it. Pretty cool. Okay, I'll come clean. If you were in the stream during this shrine, you'll know that the second puzzle took me... 10 whole minutes for some reason. I really don't know why it took me that long. Maybe it has something to do with the fact that I had already been streaming for over three and a half hours by that point. I don't know. But it does prove that this shrine isn't so easy that you don't have to think about the solution at all, which is good. But yeah, that was pretty embarrassing. At least I solved it all on my own in the end. That T1 mirror. <gasps> See? I don't need you guys at all. There we go. See? All me. Number 23, Kudanisar Shrine, Bridging the Sands. Remember how I said way earlier in Mayata Shrine, a sliding device? That sliding across sand with a hovercraft is fun, but sadly that shrine didn't do a whole lot with it. Well, this shrine does do a whole lot with that, so it's automatically great. It starts with some admittedly pretty awkward platforming across some flowing quicksand with some planks that really doesn't seem to have an intended way to get across at all. But after that you make it to an orb goal, from which you launch the orb all the way across the gigantic room, and you have to grab a hovercraft and make your way over to it. You could just go directly to it, but there are two bonus chests which you can go to first. The first one is just kind of sitting out in the open, nothing too interesting about it, but the second one is on a higher platform with an enemy, and you gotta use some nearby planks to get up to it. When you finally do make it to where the orb was launched to, you have to ascend up to a platform, take out some enemies, put the orb on a hovercraft, open the gate, and make your way back to the goal. But once you finally get there, you're still not done, as you have to make a long bridge with planks to get up to where the goal is, so that you can finally be done with the shrine. Now this is obviously pretty fun, but sadly there is an insanely easy cheese strat here. Remember how I said at the start that the orb gets launched away from you? While this is really funny in my opinion, it also makes it so that you can just recall the orb before it lands in the enemy base on the other side, thus letting you completely skip the hovercraft section. I don't think this really ruins the shrine at all, because it seems to me like something most players won't figure out, especially on their first go. I personally didn't even think of this until someone in my chat pointed it out. And even if you do figure this out, you have to act it out quickly, since if it does fall behind the wall, you can't recall it anymore. And regardless, you do still have to make your way across that first segment. So it's not like it skips the entire shrine. It's just worth noting, and the shrine definitely suffers a little bit from it. Not a lot though. Number 22, Yan Samin's Shrine, Proving Grounds, Low Gravity. Alright, first of all, this is another one of those shrines where I'm like, how did they not make this a blessing? Because before you get to it, you have to make your way to an extremely long waterfall coming from a sky island, so you can swim up it with the Sora armor, so you can make a floating rocket platform to another sky island, where you'll activate a wall panel that turns on a bunch of wind turbines, allowing you to make your way up a tall island that's really high up in the sky, so that at the end you can skydive your way through a bunch of lasers, which I was of course amazing at. After that you land in some water, which is nearby the shrine. If this was a blessing it really wouldn't be the best one or anything, but I think it's again completely fair to expect this one to be a blessing, when looking at what the criteria for others being a blessing sometimes can be. Anyways, getting into the actual shrine, it's a proving grounds based on low gravity, which in itself isn't very intuitive to combat, but what makes me love this shrine is how everything is laid out. 
As with any proven grounds, you can totally just steamroll your way through all the enemies, but if you actually try engaging with all the objects and such in here, this can quickly become one of the funniest shrines in the game. Like, there are bomb barrels all around you that you can attach to weapons and throw them, or pick up and jump across these perfectly spaced, perfectly spaced floating plat, perfectly spaced floating platforms, so that you can throw it against the enemy. Come on, really, man. Needless to say, this shrine is just hilarious if you let it be. Even if you just try to fight like normal, funny stuff is bound to happen because of the low gravity. Like this. Or this. It almost makes it feel like the goal of this proven grounds wasn't to provide an interesting scenario to fight enemies in, but more so to make a goofy, silly shrine that sticks with the player, and I think they did a great job. This shrine is really memorable, and I encourage you all to try as many things as you can if you ever find yourself playing or replaying this shrine. Number 21, Utsushok Shrine, Long or Wide. The gimmick here is hitting orbs with these swinging plates to get them across some rails and into their goal. The first one is simple enough, you know, introducing the concept and all that, but for the second one the rails go upwards and you have to make your own hammer by putting a block on the plates to hit the orb. And remember how in Kamatuki Shrine, A Precise Strike, you also had to do that, but I said it didn't really matter so I didn't see a point in it? Well here it does matter since the plate has way fewer pre-coded spots the cube will latch onto, and you have to put it in the right spot so it doesn't hit the ground or something. After this is when the shrine gets really good. Now you have to hit a ball that's a bit too far away from the swinging plate, but you're given a big metal plank to work with instead of a cube, so you gotta find a way to attach it so that it'll reach the ball when you swing it. And again, there are very few pre-coded spots the plank can go on, so it's up to you to figure out the most optimal way to make the hammer. Doing this gets you a minecart that rolls into a different track off to the side, and you have to use the same plate and plank to build something that'll hit the minecart, so that you can ride it to the end. That is so clever, and it's much more fun than just having that third orb open a gate to the exit, which they just as well could have done. Sadly, the bonus chest isn't that great. It's on a platform that you just pick it off from as you ride the minecart, which yeah, is lazy, but the shrine is excellent besides that, and it went on a bit longer than I expected, which is a good thing. Number 20, Domizuin Shrine, a prone pathway. Very simple idea, you've definitely seen this before in video games. You're inside this giant cube with some protruding platforms that you can spin either horizontally or vertically, and you gotta make your way to the top where the exit is waiting for you. It's really not that deep and you can probably figure it out pretty quickly, but it's in the bonus chest where this shrine really shines. There are three of them, which is already more than most shrines. The first one is really easy, just spin the cube in such a way that there's an opening besides the platform where the chest is, but the other two are inside the cube and you gotta figure out ways to get to them. For one of them you gotta orient the cube in such a way that you can just ascend under the platform that has the chest at the very top, but the last chest can actually be pretty tricky. Even if you have the chest and the platform upright, you can't just simply ascend to it. Not to mention that the switch to spin the cube horizontally is on the outside, so you can't always hit it with an arrow as sometimes a wall will be in the way. Eventually I figured it out by getting the chest in a position where the next vertical spin would put the platform it's on upright, and then stand by it as I hit the switch. This whole puzzle is just so well thought out because again, you gotta keep in mind that sometimes you can't hit the outside switch, but there are a ton of smart silent things the devs teach you here. It's so smart that the shrine starts on a lower level that makes you ascend through a pillar first, because not only does it silently put the ascend ability into your mind again, which you'll need a lot for the puzzle, but it also makes it so that you can always go back to the start if you softlock yourself out of the cube with no way to get back inside, which did actually happen to me. I feel like at the end when you're on top of the cube, they want you to spin it in such a way that the stairs leading to the exit doesn't have a big hole in front of it, but you can just, yeah, do that. Not a big deal at all though, obviously. Number 19, Jiukang Shrine, built for rails. Hilarious name aside, this shrine is focused on building metal plates in such a way that you can use them as platforms to slide across some rails. The first example is obviously super simple, but by the second one it gets more complicated as the rails now take some turns and you have to find a way to not have the plate slip off, which you do by putting something in the middle and flipping it upside down, so that middle plate can go in between the two rails. After this comes a really cool puzzle. It starts with two separate sets of rails that go up in a curve and then switches to one set of rails that then also goes up and makes a big turn. Apparently this was one of those puzzles that gave a sizable amount of people some troubles, at least from what I've heard, but I never really saw it as that hard. I think it might have been because you kind of have to think ahead a bit with preparing for it to switch from two tracks to one track, if that makes sense. 
I'm obviously not trying to pretend like I'm smarter than everyone because I didn't get stuck here, but I think the fact that I've heard some people struggle a bit with this puzzle while personally seeing nothing wrong with the design makes it a solid, challenging shine. And I think it's really satisfying to plan ahead for that last bit and see it work out exactly how you imagined. The bonus chest is also pretty nice, as you have to make a platform on some reels that stays put, along with a slant so that you can make it up to the chest. Not very standout, but still pretty good. Yeah, that's uh, all I really have to say about this shrine. It's just a very solid one that I can't add much more to. Number 18, Yochi Ui Shrine, Courage to Pluck. This is just Jenga, that's what it is. You play Jenga in here. And just like that game, you lose if you make the tower fall, which in this case makes the whole tower drop down into the void and makes all the blocks reset to their original position. The blocks are made of metal and the main goal is to successfully pluck two of the blocks so that you can use them to conduct some electricity to power this platform, which will then move itself close enough to the tower for you to just grab the orb from the top, which you need to open up the gate to the exit. There are two bonus chests in here and they're both pretty good. The first one is hidden in the back of the Jenga tower and you gotta pluck it out of there without making the tower fall, which isn't that hard but it's still pretty interesting. And for the second one you need to use blocks to make it up to a platform. I feel like they intended for you to grab a bunch of blocks and make a staircase or something, but I just placed one block on the platform and ascended it through it. Easy peasy. One thing I want to mention is that this shrine has a hilarious cheese strat. You can just grab pieces of the tower and hit the A button over and over again to stick all the pieces together so that you can finally just grab the whole thing and then pluck the orb from the top. That's so funny, like imagine whipping out some glue in an actual game of Jenga. You'd definitely get banned from family game night. I don't mind this cheese being possible at all because again it's so funny and you definitely feel amazing for thinking of it yourself. Number 17, Kurakat Shrine, Roro's Blessing. And here we have my favorite riddle shrine in the game. There's this weird spinny device with some protruding bits and a couple of holes for you to put planks into. It seems extremely random and the nearby construct gives you the riddle, dye the white pattern black when the sun awakens in the sky, then will the sacred shrine appear. And this can mean anything. I feel like most people will gravitate towards the dying clothes mechanic. I mean, they literally use the word die in there. Do you have to dye some white piece of armor black and then come back here at sunrise? Well, no, it actually doesn't have anything to do with clothing at all. The white pattern refers to this white stone formation on the wall, and dying it black refers to a shadow, more specifically a shadow that's in the right spot at sunrise, which is at about 6 a.m. And at that time slot, the shadow of that weird spinny pillar lines up with the stone pattern on the wall. You have to orient it in such a way that one of those stone protrusions covers this piece of white stone. And you gotta slot in a wooden plank so it casts a shadow over this piece of stone. If you successfully do all that, the shrine will appear. I gotta say, this has to be the single most satisfying moment in the game for me. Figuring this all out without an online guide or anything, just by my own wits, was an extremely memorable moment for me. Believe it or not, I'm usually not really a fan of those classic Zelda riddles, as they're almost always extremely obvious and sound super silly. But this one is actually extremely well done. Probably my favorite one in the series, actually. Even when you've solved the riddle, you still have to use your brain on the actual puzzle, by figuring out where to slot in a wooden slab and exactly how to orient the structure. Great stuff. Number 16, Marari In Shrine, Rose Blessing. Remember Eventide Island from Breath of the Wild? That one island that stripped you of all your belongings and it was one of the highlights of the entire game? Yeah, this shrine takes place there and they did not do the same thing, but what they did do is still really good. Eventide Island has turned into a hangout for a large group of pirates, and there are three outposts on the island that you gotta take out, all with a different loose theme. The one on Koholint Rock provides you with a homing cart and a bunch of Zona devices you can slap on it, which is always fun. Taranbo Beach South is in one of those monster outposts with a rolling spiky ball and walls, and Taranbo Beach North is built around a series of wooden spires, making for a more vertical-oriented combat. After you've defeated these three outposts, you can head to the back of the large rock on the island to find a cave with an entire pirate ship in it, and a bunch more enemies for you to fight. There's even a boss Mokoblin, presumably the captain of all these pirates. Once you're done with that, you can stick some planks together on the rear of the ship to make your way into a smaller cave that houses the shrine. I love this shrine so much because it essentially tells a story. Many NPCs in the game tell you of a group of pirates that have taken over Luralin village, and once you've saved them, you're told that the pirates come from Eventide Island, which is nearby. So you can then choose to infiltrate their base, take out all the pirates, and steal their treasure. You even walk the plank at the end, so to say. Not many shrines tell a story, and I really like how this one handles it. 
even if the shrine is technically not related to it. Also, you may be wondering what happens if you go to this cave before taking out the three enemy outposts on the island, and the answer is that the pirate ship in the cave won't be there. And not only is the cave with the shrine surrounded by spikes, but it's also barred off, so you're pretty much required to take out all the pirates first. Really smart that they did that, otherwise you could've just skipped the whole thing with a rocket shield or something. Number 15, Kadownar Shrine, Water Makes Away. This is the last shrine that focuses on those obsidian slabs, or stone slabs. Oh wait, they're called lava slabs? But they're not lava anymore. That's... oh whatever. What I love so much about this shrine is that it utilizes almost every zone eye ability you have. First you have to make a pathway with some slabs, which you can do in a number of ways. I chose to just carry the hydrant above my head and walk across them. Then you get the bonus chest, which makes you create a bridge of some sort with the slabs using Ultra Hand, of course. Then you have to destroy a breakable wall for which you actually have to use the Fuse ability, which is easily the least used ability in shrines. And finally, after that, there's some lava you gotta cross to get to the exit, but it's flowing against your direction. So you gotta get a slap at the end of it, let it float towards you, and then stand on it and recall to get to the exit. The only ability this shrine doesn't make you use is Ascend. I would have loved if there was a second where you had to put a stone slab or two together on top of a ledge so you can ascend through it. But even without that, this shrine is just excellent. Really, I can't say much more about it. Just a lot of very solid puzzles, utilizing most of your abilities and the scarcely used hydrants. Number 14, Rakashok Shrine, a reflective device. This is a light reflection puzzle, which you already know I love, but it's done exceptionally well here. First, the concept is just introduced super easily as usual, but then you have to lift the mirror up and through a hole in some bars, which is already interesting, and it teaches you that you can hold a mirror anywhere with Ultra Hand to shine the light from anywhere. Going into the next room, there's a mirror and a target for it on the floor, but there's no light source nearby at all, which may stump you for a bit until you realize you have to go back a room and use the mirror and light source from the previous puzzle to shine some light into the next room, which then allows you to shine a light onto the panel on the floor. That's so cool. After that, a pillar brings you upwards and you're still not done with that initial light source as you also need it for the bonus chest here, and this can actually be really tricky to aim correctly. You have to use Ultra Hand to hold it in a specific spot, which the shrine taught you earlier. That's cool. I feel like I did this wrong though, because you're also given a cube here that I did not use because I don't know how you would anyways. Maybe the answer is super obvious, but with the position of the light beam, I pretty much had to stand below the wall panel and shine the light into the camera, which did work. After this is some pointless combat. Cool. I mean, one of them has a weapon with a mirror on it, but you don't need it at all. The panel you have to shine light on is behind a little wall, and you have to use two provided mirrors to shine around it. Honestly, not really a hard puzzle at all, especially after the bonus chest before this, but it's still a creative way to close out this great shrine. Sadly, this is the last light reflection puzzle in the ranking. You had a good run, Mirror Zone Eye Device. At least you get used more in the Lightning Temple, which I will talk about in a different video. Wink wink, subscribe, wink wink. Number 13, Kikakin Shrine, Shining in the Darkness. Going from a shrine based around light, here's a shrine based around darkness. I swear that's just a coincidence. At the start, you're given what is probably the most useless zone eye device in the whole game, the light, and you have to use it to navigate a big dark maze. Your main goal is to find a floor panel that you can lift up, which has a chest with a key in it that you have to bring back to the start to open a locked door to the exit. Pretty simple. That alone is pretty cool, I guess. Shrines with darkness like this are extremely rare, so it stands out in that regard. But really, number 13 out of 152? What makes it rank this high? Well, the answer lies with the bonus chests. Normally, they don't influence my opinion of the shrine by too much, but this one has four bonus chests in it. Combined with the one required chest with a key in it, that's a total of five chests, more than any other shrine in the game. Let's go over all of them. The first one I found was behind this cube with a pattern around it that I had to notice and place in the right spot with Ultra Hands to get up to it. The second one was in a dead end through these two walls of spikes that move to and away from each other. The third one was past some honestly insultingly easy to dodge lasers that you can see in the darkness. Touching one of them just makes a wall of spikes move in on you super slowly. That one kinda sucks. But the last one was really cool. You gotta notice this hole in the wall with some light shining from it that you have to ascend through to find the fourth bonus chest and another light to carry. This shrine's design philosophy is almost the same as the entire game. There's obviously a main objective with a big wealth of optional side stuff for you to do. 
it's not exactly the same. I get that the gimmick is to find the one chest in here that has what you need, with all the other chests being duds, since most of them give you some pretty useless gemstones, and one decently nice bow. But that's still a very unique idea for a shrine, evident by the fact that this is the only shrine with more than three chests. I love this shrine for that reason, but I have to point out the obvious elephant in the room. You can choose this entire thing with bright bloom seeds, which is how you're taught to deal with darkness because of the depths. But since you're given a carryable light at the very beginning, it's obvious that you're supposed to use that to illuminate the shrine. So you can just choose to do that over using bright bloom seeds. And honestly, the entire game is about deciding to do or not to do something, so I don't think the option of using bright bloom seeds ruins the shrine at all. It's more so that you can ruin the shrine for yourself by doing that, which is in my opinion, mostly on the player. I don't think it's the same as choosing a shrine with a dumb solution, since that's still something you have to come up with, whereas this is something that takes no time to come up with because of the depths. But it's still obvious that the developers don't want you to do that here. Number 12, Simo Siwak Shrine, Proving Grounds, Lights Out. As you might expect, this shrine is also in the dark, making it one of only two shrines in the game covered in darkness, the other one obviously being the previous entry. I swear that's also just a coincidence. Anyways, remember how I pointed out that you can cheese the previous shrine insanely easy by just using Bright Bloom Seeds? Well, that's not an issue here because it's a Proving Grounds, meaning you're stripped of all your equipment, including Bright Bloom Seeds, so you're forced to deal with the darkness. Honestly, they could have also just made the previous one a Proving Grounds but without enemies, since you didn't need any of your equipment in it, but I digress. Something I love here is that they give you shields with lights on them for you to navigate the dark, which is awesome because just using them costs shield durability meaning your vision is tied to a limited resource, and two of the enemies here also use light shields, so defeating them gives you more time to work with lights. Man, this shrine is just so well thought out. You're also given some rubies later, which you can attach to your weapon to create fireballs that also illuminate the dark, which the nearby captain even teaches you because it also has a ruby on its weapon. I clearly love this shrine a lot, but a major gripe I do have with it is that it is insanely short. There are only three enemies to defeat in here, making it by far the proving grounds with the least amount of constructs in it. I like the idea of the shrine so much that it's just such a shame it's over so quickly. If it was longer with more enemies and rooms in it, then it'd easily be in my top 10 of this list. Number 11, John Sao Shrine, Deep Force. Remember that phenomenon we all played with in pools as kids where if you hold something buoyant underwater and let go, that it'll shoot back upwards? I know y'all have done that with one of these bad boys before. Well, this shrine is based on that concept, which is really cool in its own right. This is one of those shrines where even the first puzzle that's meant to introduce the concept can be challenging, seeing as this normally isn't a mechanic you use at all in the game. The second puzzle is the same thing but with a plank instead of a ball. Oh god, keep your chin covered. Because of its shape, it won't shoot up fast enough if you dip it in horizontally, so you gotta turn it vertically, at which point it'll shoot up crazy fast because it's not being held down by nearly as much water above it. For the last puzzle, there's a sliding elevator being held up by a plank. It's too high up for you to reach with Ultra Hand, so you gotta use one of those balls to hit the plank out of the way, so that you can then finally stand on the platform to rocket link in the air with it, allowing you to glide to the exit. I just love how they base a shrine on a super mundane concept that we all remember from childhood. Like I said, most of us have probably played around with one of those tiny foam surfboards in a pool, and because of that, we all know that if you hold a buoyant board vertically underwater and let go, it'll shoot up with great force. Something negative I do want to point out is that the bonus chest is horrible. In between the first and second puzzle, there's a bit you gotta walk through by some water with some pointless combat, and the chest is just sitting in the water here. There are other shrines where the bonus chest is just sitting in some water, but with those you at least have to use Ultra Hand nearby said body of water, which might make you notice the chest cause it'll glow like all interactable objects do while using Ultra Hand. Here there is no need to use Ultra Hand near this body of water at all, so you literally just have to think to use it here. Terrible chest. I would have loved it if you had to knock it off a high platform by the wall with a buoyant plank or something, similar to the last puzzle here. But, guess what? We finally made it to the top 10 shrines in the game. The first three here I initially rated a 9 out of 10 in my notes, just like the previous couple, but the top 7 are all the shrines I gave a perfect 10 out of 10, so just keep that in mind from where we get there. Number 10, Kaharatak Shrine, Drifting Flame. This shrine starts with a small puzzle where you have to light a candle above you. It's just simply there to let players know that flames can be ignited on upside down candles because it'll be important for the main puzzle. There's a button here where if you stand on it, the floor in front of you will move downwards, and after that, three upside down candles appear above it, and you have to find a way to ignite those. Good luck. 
This is again one of those shrines where it really feels like there is no intended solution. What I did was grab a nearby carryable candle, stand underneath where all the upside down candles will appear for a little bit, and then place it down so that I can stand on the button again and recall it from there, which will make it take the route I carried it again while the torches are there this time, lighting them one at a time, solving the puzzle, and opening the door to the exit. This is such a fantastic idea that I think can really stump some players. I'm pretty sure what I did was the intended solution, but the shrine also provides you with a standard torch, which makes me think there is no intended way to do this. In fact, I'm pretty sure that in my first playthrough I didn't realize you could pick that candle up, so I picked up the torch with Ultra Hand, ignited it, moved to that under the candles, and then recalled the torch while standing on the button, which also worked of course. No matter what you do to solve it, this shrine makes you feel like a genius. The bonus chest is kinda disappointing though. It's one of those where you just have to notice it under the floor that goes down when you glide to it. I thought that because it was next to a floor that goes down that you have to pick up the candle and put it on the bun or something, but that's not heavy enough. Maybe there is a way to hold the bun down without Link and without using any outside materials, but I wouldn't know. Either way, you'd still have to just kinda notice it. Number 9, Ryogok Shrine, Force Transfer. This one starts with you simply attaching a pole to a cock so that it can turn another cock to open the door, which is a puzzle straight out of the Wind Temple, so it's not unique in that regard. But that cock turning also causes this big cock in the next room to turn, which you need for the following puzzle. You need to use poles for this puzzle, so if you try to grab the one you used before, it won't turn at all, and it'll even close the door, which can force you to reattach it to the turning cock with the gates blocking your view, kinda giving you some consequences for your mistake, which pretty much no shrine without combat does. There is a pole here that you can attach to this broken lever, which when you flip it, gives you another pole. Wow, awesome. You need to use one of the poles and attach it to a sliding platform here so that the turning cock will push it upwards. And you need to put the second pole on top of it but under a second sliding platform so that that one will be pushed upwards towards the exit. After that it's just a matter of ascending twice and then waiting for the platform to be pushed up. I love how almost every puzzle of this shrine connects to create something bigger. I said earlier in Rakashok Shrine a reflective device that I love it when shrines do something like that. The bonus chest here is also pretty cool. It's very high up and sitting right on a ledge's edge, so you gotta use the poles to stick the chest to it so you can get it down. Not too crazy, but still creative and surprisingly unique. Number 8, Kyo Yoyu Shrine, Fire and Ice. So at the start you're presented with fire and ice. Wow, imagine that. The fire is blasting onto a big bun which you have to push in with the ice cube, but you obviously can't do that because the fire will melt it. But there's also this other bun you can hold down with the ice that the cube is too big for, so you use the fire to melt it a little bit, letting it fit in the gap to press the button down. This leads to a different room in which you can fly up and find new ice cubes being continuously melted by more fire. So you use this nearby stone plate to block the fire, letting you grab the ice cube. Then you just slide it down some spikes and go with it, and congratulations, you just got another big cube of ice. What are you supposed to do with that? Can't exactly use that one to push the big button down cause it'll also melt. You can at least place it on this elevated platform to ascend through in order to reach the bonus chest, but that's just the bonus chest, doesn't exactly help you in clearing the shrine. Well, what you're supposed to do is attach that stone slab you used before to an ice cube after you got it by blocking the fire with it. Then you're supposed to slide it down the spikes along with the ice cube, and then use that to push the big button in, since the slab will protect it from the fire. Absolutely genius. Most people will probably not think right off the bat to also grab the stone slab since you already used it to solve a puzzle. This is one of the best examples of you having to use an object for multiple parts in the same shrine. It just seems so unexpected. The bonus chest is also amazing because if you didn't take the stone slab with you initially, like I did, you can at least use the ice cube to get the chest, making it so you didn't waste your time while still having learned something. Number 7, first one that's a 10 out of 10, Kyokugon Shrine, Alignment of the Circles. Remember that one shrine in Breath of the Wild where you had to look at the patterns on the wall and count how many of each different constellation there was and then line that up with the amount of lights there are besides each orb goal and it was easily the hardest shrine in that game? Well this shrine kinda feels like a spiritual successor to that one, except a bit easier to figure out. At a first glance this shrine just has a bunch of orb goals and a couple of orbs besides them. There are more places you can put the orbs than there actually are orbs, so what the hell are you supposed to do? Well the answer lies in the name of the shrine, Alignment of the Circles. One thing you may have noticed throughout your playthrough is that every single non-blessing shrine's ceiling is made out of some kind of liquid, and in that liquid are these weird green circles. This shrine obviously also has those circles, and the spots where you put those orbs in are also circles, 
So you may notice that every one of those ceiling circles lines up perfectly with one of those goals. And there are just as many ceiling circles as there are orbs. So with all that information gathered, you're supposed to figure out that you have to put an orb in every orb goal that lines up with a circle. And bada bing bada boom, that's the solution. I love this idea so much because like I said, those ceiling circles are in every single shrine that isn't a blessing. So naturally you stop paying attention to them after a while, because they've never served a purpose up until now. The bonus chest is also good. Near the exit is one more ceiling circle, but there's no orb goal under it. Until you try using Ultra Hand, and then see that you can remove a tile from the floor, which has an orb goal hiding under it. Put the last orb in there, and bam, you get the bonus chest amazingly creative shrine, even if it is very reminiscent of a Breath of the Wild shrine. Number 6, Marakugak Shrine, Wield Wonders. This is THE shrine I saw game developers online be most impressed by because of the physics engine in this game. I'm no game developer, obviously, but just look at this. Even I know it's super impressive that all those bridge segments move exactly how you'd expect them to when pulled by a big wheeled cart like that, and it's a fun puzzle too because of it. I remember actually struggling with this one in my first playthrough, because you have to attach that metal slab in a very specific spot, otherwise it'll just whack out, because physics. I did skip over a little bridge puzzle at the start though, where you have to attach a broken bridge piece to some hanging pieces on the other side. You never have to repair bridges again in this shrine, so I think this is just here to throw you off from the solution of the next puzzle, which is clever. After that you just attach two pieces of a broken cart together, so that you can ride it across some lava. Not that crazy honestly, but after that comes a cool puzzle that was also shared a lot online. But this time not for a very positive reason. That's a lot of balls. What are we doing with these balls? If I put all the balls in here, does it weigh it down enough that that opens the door? I mean, that's a lot of tedious work. Why would we do it that way? What is the puzzle here? Why do we even need this thing? Huh? Oh, those geniuses at Nintendo, man. What do they think of next? Anyways, this puzzle rocks. There are a ton of metal balls on the floor next to a big wall with holes at the bottom with a giant button on the other side. You're obviously supposed to get a lot of those balls on top of that button, so they'll weigh it down, which you can of course do by just picking them up one at a time. But where's the fun in that? There's this slab on the other side with a shape that makes it extremely obvious that you can put it on this wheeled wonder over here that's facing the balls. Doing this creates a device that will essentially cup all of those balls and push them through the holes at the bottom of the wall, onto the bun. And this is just insanely satisfying. I really don't have much more to say about this, it's just so cool and I love it. The bonus chest is fine, you have to use the weirdly shaped slab to make a little slant up to it. Not that crazy, but also not that bad. Number 5, Maya Chidek Shrine, Proven Grounds, The Hunt. This shrine puts the spotlight on my favorite underutilized Zona device, the homing cards. If you activate them, they will continuously chase and ram into nearby enemies. First you get a little example with two of them and only one enemy, with just some spikes you can put on the cards. And after that you enter this massive room with a ton of enemies and a lot more homing cards. What I love most about this shrine is that there are no extra homing cards at the start of this room. If you want more of them, you're gonna have to rush headfirst into the enemies, dodging them while frantically building up an army of deadly homing cards. This shrine is just ridiculously fun in my opinion, especially so if you challenge yourself to deal no damage with Ling's weapon at all, only the homing cards. Which, I mean, the shrine is based around those, so I feel like it's pretty common for players to put that limitations on themselves here, unless you hate fun or something. It's also just a really entertaining shrine because the homing cards are super volatile if you let them be, and you have no armor, so you can easily get killed by your own homing cards if you're not careful, especially if you don't have a lot of hearts because you want to max out your stamina wheel as soon as possible, like me. What more can I say about the shrine? It's just so much fun to run around trying to build up your troops with deadly weapons while the constructs can deal some serious damage to you if you're not careful. At the end, when there's only one construct left, it's pretty likely for all your buddies to just gang up on it, which is also, of course, endlessly entertaining. I love you, homing cart. May the player base be kinder to you in the future. Seriously, just try playing around with them every once in a while. They're so much fun, and they're also based on dogs. Check out this video if you want to learn more about that. Wink wink. Number 4, Taoyu Sipun Shrine, Forward or Backward? Hey look, it's the only shrine in the game with a question mark in its name. That's interesting, I think. 
Anyways, this shrine is based around the recall ability, which definitely isn't that unique, but I think it makes up for that because there are 5 whole dedicated puzzles in this shrine, which is a lot more compared to every other shrine. And not only that, but all the uses here are super well thought out. First you just have to recall a rolling ball, not only to push the other balls away, but also to clock up the dispenser so no more come out. Then you get to the bonus chest which is continuously falling onto a rolling wheel that drops it into the void, so you just recall the wheel so it spins the word link. Kinda basic but it's the bonus chest so that's fine. Then you get to the third puzzle which is definitely my favorite here. There's a stone ball that continuously spawns in to roll down a slope, and you have a bun that just closes a door at the end of the slope. Your goal here is to bring this orb into that goal, which is behind the slope. So what do you do? Well, you stand on the button to close the door, wait for the stone ball to roll to the bottom, pick up the orb and place it behind the ball, and then recall the ball so that it goes back and pushes the orb along, dropping it into the goal. This is just such a clever use of recall. It really isn't what would come to mind when you'd first see this puzzle, I think. Then comes the fourth puzzle, which is admittedly kind of weak. There's an orb that keeps rolling down two sets of slopes, and you have to time a recall cancel so that its momentum is stopped in the middle, and it falls into a goal. Not a super unique puzzle since we've seen it in other shrines, but it's still kind of cool if you look at it by itself. And I mean, this one is about cancelling recall at the right time, which the others before it weren't, so I respect this inclusion here. And after that comes the fifth puzzle, which is unique. There's a platform with a cup on it that's constantly moving back and forth over a protected orb goal that's too far away for you to just simply ultra hand the orb into. So you place the orb onto the platform when it's near you, wait for it to pass over the goal, and then recall the orb so it backtracks the path it just took on the platform, letting you drop it into the orb goal below, finally opening the door to the exit. You may think this shrine isn't all that special, but I think it deserves to be held in high regard because of just how many puzzles there are in it. We've had shrines with really cool ideas but only one puzzle in it and a weak bonus chest, we've had shrines with good ideas but two puzzles and a bad bonus chest, and sometimes we get shrines with three good puzzles in it and an interesting bonus chest, which makes for a very solid shrine. But this one has four creative puzzles in it and a good bonus chest, all utilizing one of the most creative fantasy abilities I've ever seen in the game, all in different ways. I think if you add all that up together, this shrine deserves to be considered one of the best in the whole game. Number 3, Rasi Tagiwak Shrine, Proving Grounds, Vehicles. And here we have the best proving grounds in the game. As you may expect, this one is all about vehicles. There are a ton of enemies in this one and there's also a lot of random Zonai stuff around for you to make some cool death machines. And while yes, using that is obviously a lot of fun, something you may notice is the cage in the center, which you can get into if you ascend through this platform on the opposite side of the shrine you spawn in from, which has a flying machine for you to get above it, letting you drop in. And there you'll find a ton of Zonai devices for you to build a monster of a combat vehicle with. There's a car with four wheels, a steering stick, two cannons, and a spiky wall in the front. And around that are two construct heads and a bunch of emitters, including a hydrant. I don't really know what you're supposed to do with that, but whatever, it's funny. What I love so much about this shrine is that yes, you can build a cool death machine and kill all the enemies with it, but it's not a free win, as you still have to keep in mind how you build said machine. If it's not perfect, it can whack out in a couple different ways, primarily through the construct heads, which you'll soon come to learn can really mess you up. I actually died three times in this shrine because I wasn't careful with my builds, and even when I wasn't dying, I still messed up a few times because I made my machine in such a way that it could harm me by shocking Link because of, I think, the hydrant's water conducting the electricity from the shock emitter on the front. I never really minded dying all too much though because this shrine is so much fun that every death was another attempt I'd get at building something new. This shrine just promotes creativity so much, which the whole game is about obviously. It's a shame that I almost cleared my first attempt without even setting foot in the center cage, which some players will obviously unknowingly do, missing out on the fun of this shrine without even knowing it. On my final attempt I had the genius idea to detach the spiky wall on the front and use it as a shield for Link because I was getting tired of the construct heads spawning at Link and killing me. And this worked extremely well, again reinforcing the theme of creativity here. Getting awarded for that idea by letting me blast the absolute hell out of some fools with my cool self-made construct slaying machine was so much fun. This is how every proven ground should be, and I think this easily deserves to be the best one. Number 2, Siamotsu Shrine, Unlit Blessing. Here it is, the single most well-known shrine in the game. And for good reason, it's just insanely memorable. Let's get real for a moment. 
this game has a shit ton of blessing shrines, and most of them are either underwhelming or just flat out suck. I mean, there's a reason the bottom of this ranking was absolutely filled with blessing shrines. This game also has a lot of good shrines, so it's always disappointing when you step into one where it's not extremely obvious that it'll be a blessing, only for it to be a blessing. It just always gives you this feeling of, ugh, damn, another blessing? Alright, let's just get this over with and collect the reward. Which obviously isn't a good feeling. The unlit blessing is located at the entrance of one of the three Lomei Sky Castles, specifically the one in the Garuda region, which you're likely to visit last. The other two Lome castles don't have blessings at their entrance, since it's not really a challenge to get to them. So when you get to this one, expecting a normal shrine, only to be hit with the shrine intro without a background, which is how everyone can tell a shrine is a blessing, it gives you that same disappointing feeling of, man, really? So you just go to the exit to collect your reward as usual, when out of nowhere... What the hell is this? The shrine suddenly jips you out of the exit by moving it super far away from you. Now granted, the shrine isn't called Raru's Blessing, and there are some elements here that no other blessing shrines have, such as these fire fruit trees and some arrows on the floor, but the interior of every other blessing shrine is the exact same, and you're almost always going through them with the same disappointing feeling, so these new details are likely to not stick out to you, same with the slightly different name. I know they didn't to me the first time I went through here. The actual puzzle here is that on the part that flew away from you, there are two torches that aren't lit, and you have to light them with fire, obviously. If you do that, the bonus chest moves to the side, exposing this launcher, which you can use to launch yourself to the exit and finally finish the shrine. I also just love how instead of putting the exit back where it was, they do something even more unique for blessings and let you launch yourself towards the exit. If I can't list one complaint, I wish the fire fruit trees weren't in this shrine, they can give away that something is off about this blessing more than anything else in my opinion. And you really don't need them to light the candles because you can just use the other candles that are still on your platform to ignite your normal arrows. I feel like this would have also made the shrine more of a puzzle instead of only a really good gotcha moment, but that is a small complaint. If I can be real for a second, this is the single most memorable moment in Tears of the Kingdom to me. It's almost like the developers realized people won't like going through so many bad blessings, and use that feeling of disappointment to trick the player into thinking this is going to be the same thing, only to pull the rug out from under them. In my complete, honest opinion, this incredibly memorable moment almost justifies the amount of weak blessing shrines in the game for me, but I can't in good faith put this shrine at number 1 on my ranking. Maybe in a couple of years when I haven't played this game for a while, but I still remember this moment right here, I'll call this my favorite shrine without a second thought. But for now, I think it deserves the number 2 spot at the very least. So what do I think is the best shrine in the game? Which one takes up the number 1 spot? It's not a shrine that I think sticks out in many people's minds, so I doubt many of you already know by process of elimination. I'm gonna stop stalling now and just get on with it. Here is my favorite shrine in Tears of the Kingdom. Number 1, Tadarok Shrine, Fire and Water. Let me break down why I love this shrine so much. One of my favorite types of puzzles are those that are based around the elements and how certain types of materials react to them. You know, how fire burns, ice can melt, water conducts electricity, and so on. This shrine puts those mechanics front and center. It starts out with a pool of water that's electrified and you have to cross, so you put in a nearby stone block to hop across it, since stone doesn't conduct electricity. Then there's an ice block dispenser next to some fire that's constantly melting the ice so you grab the stone block from before to cover the ice, and now you have an ice block as well as a stone block. There's also another pool of electrified water with a metal block in it conducting the electricity, that you can just simply fish out, and then on the right is a pool of lava that you have to cross, but it's so big that you'll need to put two blocks in it to cross. You have three blocks right now, so which ones should you use? That's right, the stone and metal ones, because the ice block would just melt. This gets you to a wooden block dispenser that's also next to some fire, so it keeps burning the wood, but it's too close to the wall for you to block it with another block, like with the ice cube dispenser. So what do you do? Well, it takes a while for the wood to completely burn, so you have to pick it up and quickly dip it in some nearby water. That's convenient. After all that, you'll have four blocks of different materials. Stone, ice, metal, and wood. And now comes my favorite part. You have to stack them in such a way that it lets you get up the high ledge that has the shrine's exit on top of it. But there's also a bunch of different elemental hazards at the ledge. 
so you'll have to keep in mind what order you stack the elemental cubes so they don't get destroyed. The first block needs to be placed in some electric water for you to stand on. Wood and ice don't work because they're too light and they'll just float and spin while you stand on it. And metal doesn't work because it'll just conduct the electricity, so you're only left with stone for the bottom. After that you have to stack three blocks on top of each other and place them on a platform. The first layer has some fire blasting on it, so wood and ice won't work, meaning metal is the only viable option. And then for the top two cubes you only have wood and ice left, which can be put in any order since there are no other hazards. After all that puzzling, all that's left is to stand on the stone block at the bottom and ascend through the pillar you built. <laughs> that moment is so satisfying. Man, I love this shrine so much. Like I said, elemental puzzles are some of my favorite in the game. And I've mentioned a couple times that I also love it when all of a shrine's puzzles come together to make one continuously long challenge. Which is the case here since you used all the cubes you got from all the different puzzles at the end. I do have one small complaint though and it's related to the bonus chest. See, it's on top of a little ledge that you could get to if you were on top of a block, but none of the blocks in here are climbable. So what you have to do is place a block next to the ledge and then melt down the ice block a little bit to make kind of a staircase. Which is a really cool idea since you normally would want to avoid the ice block melting even a little bit. But the problem here is that you can actually just climb ice blocks, meaning this is really just a case of use the ice block and climb that. This makes no sense to me because you can't climb icy walls, and the game makes that explicitly clear the first time you try that. Part of the Great Sky Island tutorial is designed with that limitation in mind, so it really doesn't make sense that you can climb icy blocks. It's not really the shrine's fault and I still like the bonus chest, it just has this way too easy cheese strat that I feel like is caused by a small developer oversight when they didn't make ice blocks unclimbable in this game, because they really have no reason not to be. Still though, every puzzle in this shrine comes together and forces you to stand still and think for a moment, which all leads into a super satisfying moment at the end. It is the best designed shrine in my opinion, and thus it's my favorite shrine in Tears of the Kingdom. Unless you ask me in a couple of years, then I'll probably say it's on the blessing. So yeah, that's my ranking of all 152 shrines in this game. And to be blunt for a moment, overall, Tears of the Kingdom shrines disappointed me immensely. I already mentioned that quality wise, I think over a third of all shrines in this game are just straight up lacking. And even more beyond that are only passable in my eyes. I get that it's probably not easy to make a good shrine, especially over 150 of them, but in that case I wish the total shrine count was a lot lower so the average quality of them can be higher. I think this is why I prefer the shrines in Breath of the Wild. When that game launched it had only 120 shrines, 32 less than Tears of the Kingdom. Yeah this would mean there'd be fewer total hearts to collect, but do we really need a mainline Zelda game with a max heart count of 40? The answer is no, no we don't. Beyond puzzle quality there are just so many other problems with the shrines. For starters, literally all of them have the exact same aesthetic and themes, which was a complaint back in Breath of the Wild as well, so it really baffles me that they changed nothing about it here. Like use some different color palettes. Why not have all the shrines in the Elden region be red with fiery sparks flying around? And why not have all the Laneru region shrines be blue with waterfalls in the distance, etc etc. Maybe the music could change a bit as well to reflect the region more. Another big issue is repetition, especially with the Rose Blessing Shrines. Out of the 148 non-tutorial shrines, 51 are blessings. Now that in itself isn't a bad thing, but out of those 51 blessing shrines, 24 of them have you bring a crystal to a pedestal. That's about half of them. Now remember, there was shockingly only one crystal shrine in the game that somehow didn't end in a blessing. So usually whenever you start one of those crystal shrine quests, you already know it's gonna end with a blessing, and it takes a while to transport the crystal or just to get to it in the first place. So that's a pretty long time of you just carrying something with the thought of this is going to be a blessing already in your head, which is honestly not a great feeling. And if we look at the blessings that aren't tied to crystals, a lot of them are just flat out bad challenges, like the three Lomay Labyrinths where you just follow some nuts, or the one that's just randomly the reward for one of those three skydiving challenges, or the one that's tied to a piss easy riddle, or the ones that just exist to be fast travel points like the one before the spirit temple and the one before the wind temple, and that's not even to mention the half dozen or so that are just in a cave. That's not to say there aren't any good blessings, obviously, but most of them are disappointing, and remember, there are a lot of them. Breath of the Wild had a good chunk of blessings too, but if you ask me, they were a lot better.
I can vividly remember way more blessing shrines from that game, such as the one where you have to stand on a pedestal during a blood moon that's not near a fast travel point, or the one that comes after the fun quest with the Rito Phyllis children, and of course even Tide Island. As I'm writing this part of my script, I'm struggling to remember even one standout blessing in Tears of the Kingdom from the top of my head, and I just finished editing the entire shrine ranking segment. No, unlit blessing doesn't count. For some other fun stats stuff, there are 7 of those awful combat training shrines and 15 proven grounds. In part 1, I said most proven grounds are good, but actually looking back at it now, most of those weren't ranked super high, and a lot of them were kinda samey too, so that's just more repetition outside of the blessings too. In fact, if you ignore the crystal shrines, proven grounds, comet trainings, and rose blessings, there are a total of 74 normal shrines, aka only about half of all shrines in the game. 78 if you count the 4 tutorial shrines, and 79 if you count that one random non-blessing crystal shrine. There is a lot wrong with Tears of the Kingdom, and for me, one of the biggest things is the shrines. There are a good amount of fun ones, obviously, but the majority are either bad or painfully mid. The first shrine I gave a 7 out of 10 was the one ranked at number 71, meaning over half of all shrines are a 6 out of 10 at best, which is just kind of a whatever score really. Only 33 scored an 8 or higher, which I would classify as the Great Shrines. That's a very small amount to give big compliments to if you ask me. So all this begs to ask, will I ever make a shrine ranking for Breath of the Wild? Uh, probably not. I don't really want to think about shrines for a while, but I might change my mind in the future, so you should subscribe either way if that sounds interesting to you. Anyways, like I said earlier, I streamed my entire second playthrough where I did all shrines so I could write down my thoughts on them for this video. If you want to watch that entire playthrough, for some reason, it'll be up on my second channel. I'll link the playlist of all the VODs in the description of this video. Fair warning though, if you were to play all those VODs back to back, it would take you 2 days, 3 hours, and 21 minutes, aka about 51 and a half hours. And since I recorded pretty much that entire playthrough, the file size for all those recordings is over 750 gigabytes. Dang. I want to quickly shout out the regulars of those streams as well, which you can see on screen here. Not only were they fun company, but they also helped me write down my thoughts on the shrines every now and then. So without them, the ranking would have been a bit different. Extra shoutouts to Morgini also, that Matlat was there for like, the entirety of every stream. Crazy. And of course, as usual, big shoutouts to Wright the Yoshi, The Flying Fire, Kirk, Exobear, Lime the Chef, Giant Fire and Cole, Sheen for the Win, LureFX1, Sil700, The Game Didi, Quote is Cool, and the rest of my lovely Patreon supporters. Thanks so much for watching, especially if you made it all the way to the end. Feel free to let me know what your favorite shrine in the game is, and subscribe if you haven't already. Have a great day, bye bye.